So a very good morning, a very good evening to all of you who have taken the time to join us here today, this Saturday, 7.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time, 6 a.m. where I am and 7 a.m. where Ian is, uh, for the Himalayan Institute of Cultural and Heritage Studies Saturday Vibe Talks. And um, I'm so delighted that uh, Ian is our speaker today uh, because I just, I just love his work and he's such a dear friend. Before I go on uh, to introducing him for today, just want to tell you what our Saturday Vibe Talks are. So the Institute does these uh, free talks every Saturday. Uh, we've done almost 186 talks uh, since the start of the pandemic. And um, we've gone through it together. Uh, we've been enlightened by people who are working in the Himalayas, who are passionate about the Himalayas. And it's, it's an opportunity for us to know who is doing what and expand our uh, learning about these mountains and what goes on in these mountains so much. Uh, the institute uh, was uh, situated in Kulu Valley. We moved last September to near Shimla to have more footfall and also uh, um, be more approachable to the plains. Uh, we are in a little village called Dhami, which was an erstwhile princely state. It belongs to the family of the person who named Himachal who gave Himachal its name. So Mahima Dutt is right here. She's from that family. And it's such a good synergy that we have. And uh, the Institute is ready. We are ready to move in uh, on 1st of March. And we've been doing things in the interim. Um, we've, done, we, we've just finished a pop-up shop where we um, recycled um, uh, trash and uh, made it sellable and sh in Shimla. So the whole idea was to create awareness of, uh, uh, you know, the Himalayas being important and whatever we can do, we should be um, hands-on and apply what we do and just not talk about it. So these talks are all about that as well. Uh, we have our research scholar, Rajoli Ghosh, who finished her work in Kulu Valley. Now she's working in the region we are, and very soon she'll be working on more exciting projects. And uh, it's really exciting. Our uh, uh, administrative head and nurse, uh, Rina Solanki, uh, she just finished her uh, yoga teaching course and she's a trained instructor now so we will be doing yoga wellness and meditation uh, and a lot of uh, these other things are on the anvil um, woodworking and uh, the anthropology of food will be another addition to what we are doing pedagogy workshops on writing um, so we, we we are really excited about the future uh, we also started our newsletter in December we started with Arunachal Pradesh moving on to Jammu and Kashmir, and now we are on Philosophies of the Himalayas this month. Uh, we will be releasing the newsletter on Sunday. So those of you who haven't subscribed, go to hicks.org, H-I-C-H-S.org. I'll put it on the chat in a little bit. And it's a free subscription every month, and you can know about what all we've been doing, what all others feel about uh, the the places they've been to in um, according to the themes that the newsletter follows. So that's so much to say. And now I won't waste my time and yours and make sure that you're all focused on our speaker today, Dr. Ian Baker. So a little bit about Ian first. Ian Baker is an explorer and not just any explorer. National Geographic calls him one of the seven explorers of the millennium. And here he is. He's an anthropologist, cultural historian with advanced degrees from the University of Oxford and the University in, um, I may mispronounce this, uh, Strathclyde, is that correct? In Glasgow, Scotland. He was honored um, by, like I said, the National Geographic Society as the seven, one of the seven explorers of the, for, for the millennium for his ethnographic and geographical field research in Swas Yul Padma Kod, the hidden land arrayed like lotuses in Tibet's Sangpo Gorge region. He's the author of seven critically acclaimed books on Himalayan and Tibetan cultural history, environment, art, and medicine, including my favorite, The Heart of the World. A Journey to the Last Secret Place, Tibetan Yoga, Principles and Practices, Celestial Gallery, The Tibetan Art of Healing, and The Dalai Lama Secret Temple, Tantric Wall Paintings from Tibet, a collaborative work with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, that illuminates Dzogchen meditation practice. Um, 
He also contributed chapters in academic publications in the fields of Himalayan sacred geography, yoga and physical culture in Vajrayana Buddhism, um, yoga and transformation, historical and contemporary perspectives, and ethnogenetic substance use in Buddhist Tantra, a global history of psychedelics. Ian is one of those people who you know, when he publishes, he also applies his learning. And that is what's so wonderful about this change that we are witnessing, where academics are just not confined to the corridors of academia. They're reaching out to practical applications of how it influences our lives and changes our lives. And we have so much to learn from all of this, from years of research, like people like Dr. Ian Baker have undertaken. Today's talk is the geography of enlightenment pure realms, power places, and hidden lands in Himalayan and Tantric Buddhism. In an era of escalating environmental and human humanitarian crisis, the talk will explore human nature transactions in the development and contemporary expression of Vajrayana and Tantric Buddhism in the Himalayan world. In particularly, the talk will address the transformation of meditatively generated Buddha fields uh, into the terrestrial pure realms, known in Himalayan Vajrayan Buddhism as sacred places and hidden lands or uh, bayuls, uh, where contemplative practice and especially pilgrimage is held to be specially efficacious. While sacred vision of the natural and anthropogenically altered world may support emergence from personal suffering, planetary resilience requires insightful collective action. The talk will address the genesis as well as current trajectories of Vajrayana Buddhism in the context of tantric topographies, including Udiyana, Shambhala, and Shaktipit, and the necessity of ecologically informed ethical and environmental action in a humanly altering world. From the world as an imminent Buddha realm and subjectively realizing the ultimate non-duality of outer, inner, and hidden dimensions of reality must be balanced with wise and compassionate activism. The talk will thus make a case for the geomantic Vajrayana art of Sache to manifest Vajrayana Buddhism's essential insight into the unit, unity of Nirvana and Samsara, an active transformation of habitual egocentric existence into a more inclusive egocentric view, which is dedicated to the thriving of all species. So, this talk is just not about findings, it's about collective action, about basic human traits of compassion, about finding, about knowing who we are, and what the sacred texts in the past tell us about all of this. So without uh, uh, wasting more time, uh, here we are with Dr. Ian Baker, who will talk about all of this that I have uh, condensed uh, in short, thanks to Dr. Baker's uh, excerpt that he sent me. And uh, after he's done, we will have a um, question and answer session where you can um, uh, reach out directly and ask what you need to ask. Here you are, Ian, over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Sonali. Sonali. And it's really a pleasure to be able to participate in your extraordinary organization and all of the activities that you've exemplified in bringing academic research and archaeology and anthropology into the kind of um, dynamic uh, social action uh, that you know your institution is so known for. And so it's a great pleasure to contribute to that in whatever small way I can. And actually, after that elaborate introduction, I'm not sure how I will be able to uh, cover all those subjects, but I will try to do my best to do so. And in particular, just because I think, you know, if we're talking about the geography of, of awakening, the geography of enlightenment, um, then certainly uh, we need to to see that geography as well. So I thought I, I put I have a PowerPoint that I put together uh, that will uh, for me it's wonderful because it's kind of in all of these things. What when we think of how does geography, how does place, and the spirit of place awaken in us a remembrance of really our inter inseparability from all of life? Then it's those powerful places that that bring us into that that. Uh, that resonance that we always have, and yet which sometimes we're able to fall out of um, conscious connection with. So the the talk that I'll give today will be kind of reviewing some of those key themes that Dr. Sonali brought up, in particular, this idea of how in Tantric Buddhism, uh, which in its contemplative and meditative traditions, was really about um, envisioning 
paradisical dimensions of being that were sometimes places one could only reach actually after death or only in deep meditative samadhi states. So I think what I became very interested in is how those um, ideas in Tantric and Vajrayana Buddhism um, were eventually translated, if you will, into more imminent paradisical landscapes that could actually be be um, experienced uh, in in nature. So often, in as we'll see, in very deep and sometimes remote parts of the Himalayas. But it really goes back to the very, very genesis, I would say, of, of the and the power that for me of uh, of Indian spirituality, which is recognizing that um, those power places uh, within the imminent landscapes of our everyday experience. So, in that sense, the Shakti Pita is the place of in which the feminine power arises within our field of awareness. So, I think what I'll do is I'll share my this PowerPoint. And um, and then continue talking from there. And then we'll, as Dr. Sonali said, we'll have plenty of time afterwards for, for questions. So I'll try to keep my presentation concise. Let me see if I can get this up. Um, let's see. Um, yeah. One minute. You can go to the very bottom and click on that uh, screen. Yes. That's, that's, yeah. Yeah. I was going to click on the screen, uh, but I'm just thinking, where does it actually have? I'm using, unfortunately, a different format. So what I need to do is at the bottom. At the bottom, right, where you see that uh, screen, little screen uh, uh, icon. Yeah. Well, just the set seen. of icons next to the comments. Yeah. Okay. That's. Oh, I see. Right. You've got it. Mm -hmm. There we go. Well, it says. That the screen there where it says uh, uh, you can click or? you can click to the uh, last one if you click on the last one uh, next to that yeah here yeah, right well the one to the far right here is, yeah. okay slideshow there we go okay good so can everybody see that uh, yes it's all okay, there good. full screen all right good okay, okay. So, enlightenment with its alternative ways of looking at it so we're talking about pure realms hidden lands power places, but it's how we revisit them uh, in a certain sense with the argument being that these are all part of our intrinsic nature. So um, this first image when I mentioned about how, let's say, in the contemplative traditions, both in Hinduism and Buddhism, often we use, uh, it's not just about uh, freeing the mind from its thoughts and emotions and ideations, but often working very skillfully with creative imagination in order to engender a alternate uh, perception of reality, essentially. And so this is really, really pronounced, of course, in the Pure Land tradition of Buddhism, uh, in which the, the practice, the contemplative practice, is in order to transport oneself, essentially, uh, even in everyday experience, into a kind of paradisical uh, view uh, an experience of reality in which everything is part of an infinite, in this case, a Buddha, a Buddha field. And it's also, as we know, in Vajrayana Buddhism, it's the, the conclusion of any meditative practice is to, uh, there's kind of a, a ritual prayer, if you will, in which all, uh, may all appearances appear as Buddha realms and may all beings within that field of awareness appear as dakas and dakinis, enlightened beings, and may all sounds arise as mantra. So it's this idea of overcoming sometimes the, the um, persistent sense of separation that we can sometimes have from phenomenal reality and recognizing that it's actually a projection of our minds. And therefore, if we work creatively with our minds, then we come to kind of a dynamic resonance with all the reality in which wisdom and compassion can express itself dynamically. And I would just like to say at the outset, because I was just rereading something that I read long ago from the Dalai Lama when... He was actually in uh, in dialogue with a Korean uh, priest who said, oh, if you do all of these things in our tradition, this is in the Pure Land tradition, and you will be immediately transported to a, you know, a Pure Land. And the Dalai Lama said, I'm not interested in the Pure Land. I just want to be wherever I can be of most use. So I, I think it's also something I wanted to mention at the outset because I just stumbled across that, that quote um, this morning again in that in a sense, the, the pure lands that we, we seek and the paradises that we perceive are never 
anywhere else than where we are right now, as long as we can come into that recognition that where we are right now is the best place for us to be, to manifest our sense of service to the world. So that's why when we're all stuck behind our screens like this, sometimes it's it's good to remember, sometimes through the arc and things that I'll be sharing, that um, it's never something we should ever feel that that uh, we have to go across to the ends of the earth, to the great Himalayan uh, national parks or to the Pecos wilderness, which is behind my house here. So um, one second, I just have to get... Um, then we can, uh, you know, move forward. So this is, however, what I wanted to really stress today is how some of these ideas in Vajrayana Buddhism um, uh, translate into actual landscape. And in this case, for the Tibetans who were um, introduced to these kinds of practices of creative imagination, which is really the the forte, if you will, of the Vajrayana Buddhist tradition, the Tantric Buddhist tradition, how they brought these kinds of um, uh, ideas of working with the mind into a transformation of their own perception of their own landscape. So here we're looking in Tibet, from Tibet down towards the, the great Himalayan range, uh, with Nepal being, in this case, on the other side of this chain of mountains. Um, and this is really speaking to this idea, what, not sure how that happened. Um, but again, when we go back to how creative imagination uh, works on a transformation of, of, of our own experience of phenomenal reality, we have these extraordinary uh, iconography of the Tantric Buddhist tradition. So here we have the, the deity Hevajra uh, in union with its consort Nairatma, one without a self, because all of this is about transcending our egoic self and recognizing, if you will, our divine self in all of the complex symbolism that that represents. So I wanted to, to use this image uh, in the beginning because it speaks to many of the things that I wanted to talk about, which is here, if we situate ourselves, because of course the deity is not separate from our own nature. And the whole idea of a meditation on Hevajra and Nairatma is the, the union of our own dynamic dancing self, as it were, but with selflessness. And in a sense, it's a self-transcendent state and that's symbolized by the eight different uh, manifestations of um, the dancing goddesses as they were surrounding uh, Hevajra. And Hevajra, as we can see, and also in other iconography, is uh, completely modeled on pre-existing Bhairava, on the dynamic, ecstatic form of Shiva. And so obviously we see in, in Tantric Buddhism a deep um, synergy between the, uh, the Shaiva Shakta tantras and the buddhist tantras as they reinvented themselves in light of a the, the the tantric wave if you will that came across india from the sixth century onward and through the 12th century in which di buddhism essentially became uh very highly expressive and rather than just uh, meditative practices in order to reduce the attachment to um to thoughts and emotions and and consequent actions it was really about uh, dynamic engagement with reality. So what we can see there is one of the preeminent uh, places for tantric practice in Buddhism, and also, of course, in the Shaiva Shakta traditions were the smashans. They were the, the cremation grounds. And we see eight of those depicted, the, the eight principal ones depicted on the outer ring of the mandala. And so why were these smashans and, and cremation grounds considered so powerful as places to practice? And that was simply because practice was a way of overcoming our kind of attachment to, to a kind of binary conceptuality of life and death and birth and death. It was really, it was the creation grounds where, where life, something else emerged um, out of that, um, that place where the veils were thin, as it were, and where one was confronted with one's deepest terrors, which is, of course, in many cases, you know, the end of our earthly body, one could contemplate that profoundly. And it's often why one saw the kinds of practices that we can still see today, of course, in India, the Agori tradition, of course, has kept that very active in terms of practice in cremation grounds. But if we look at its genesis, these were places that were at the peripheries of civilization. They were out on the edges of the wilderness. They were places where the veils were thin, as it were, and therefore one could overcome the kind of social conditioning that would otherwise keep one sort of in that, that idea of samsara as a cycle of, of, of uh, discontent and um, looping thoughts that would not leave one alone and 
the, the, the cremation grounds were places where that kind of deeper sense of, uh, of reality and existence come to the fore. And I, I kind of mentioned that at, really at the outset, because a lot of the Tibetan uh, literature that uh, developed later in, uh, in Tibet was talked about these hidden lands that I'm going to be focusing on as the greatest of the of the, the cremation grounds, uh, the charnel grounds rather. And so they were places where one could go in order to be transformed. So here we see the, the, the center of the mandala. And again, as I mentioned, uh, uh, he vajra, meaning literally rejoicing into the, the adamantine nature, the vajra nature, reality, and very, very many, many things in common with the iconography of Bhairava and Shakti. We see a uh, another image, uh, in this case of um, uh, Chakra Sambara. Uh, so just trying to kind of give a little bit of an introduction for those of you who may not be fully aware of this rich iconography of the tantric form of Buddhism that developed in synchrony with various forms of, uh, of Hindu tantra, um, the Kaula traditions, the Pashupati traditions, etc. cetera. And again, uh, as I mentioned, some of the earliest um, places of, of practice were not just the um, charnel grounds, but they were places called the Shakti Pitas. And so there were, according to different texts, early texts, there were different designations of these places of power of the associated with the Yogini cults uh, of India. And what was interesting to me in this case, I mean, we see uh, the ones here, these are in uh, Uttar Pradesh and uh, one on the right in, in uh, Orissa. Uh, but that what happened here was that the actually out the inner chakras of the body were kind of transposed onto the landscape, and they became places of, of practice. And they were also meeting places. They were places in which those uh, who were initiates in this tradition could meet at these sometimes very remote um, uh, places, and they could travel from one to another. So there was again this kind of conflation of the outer power places with the actual power centers with within one's own psychophysical body. And we see that again, the same idea of the outer and the inner um, and the dissolution of that artificial boundary between the outer and the inner shown. And in here, this is a 13th century Tibetan manuscript uh, showing the, the mandala as it sense arising from the heart center. And then as a result, the kind of sh change in vision that results from that, from these practices. And you can see the awakening of the nadis, the, the uh, energy um, center, the energy uh, channels within the body and the Buddha realms uh, awakening to experiential reality first in vision, but more importantly, uh, in one's own experienced sense of, of reality. Again, details from if this is a wall painting in, in Bhutan uh, showing uh, yogi practicing in a cave, but again, with a, a kind of dynamic sense of the phenomenal natural world with full of its dragons and nagas and naginis and the sense in which nature becomes some, suddenly experienced as a dynamic expression that is inseparable from in Western tradition, the psyche, you know, the deep mind, which is not separate from that which it's in participation with. Then I want to really emphasize, and I think because of the, the length of this talk and so many things that Dr. Sonali introduced, you know, would be uh, something we would normally want to cover over several days. So I'm trying to condense a lot of things uh, into one. So if I, um, uh, if what I'm saying uh, is not entirely clear, then please address it in the questions and answers. But uh, Dr. Nice so spoke about uh, the importance of a place called Udiana in as a tantric topography. And if we look at the Buddhist tantras, the earliest ones, the Guya Samaja, um, the, um, the Chakra Sambara Tantra, etc., they all say that they originated in this kind of mystical land in the northwest frontiers of the Indian subcontinent called Udiana or Ugin Yul, as the uh, Tibetans refer to it. And this is the place where Padmasambhava, the great uh, tantric adept from the 8th century, often known as Urgen Rinpoche, in other words, the great precious teacher from Udiana, um, came from Udiana, traveled through India to Rovasart, he, and this is with his, cons his Indian consort, Mandarava, and brought the tantric teachings to Tibet in the 8th century. And uh, so a very, very 
crucial figure for the development in Tibet of, of a dynamic form of Buddhism that was already pre-existing, of course, in India as Vajrayana. But it was a very, as we've seen in the iconography alone, it's very, very clear that this was a very dynamic, uh, in a certain sense, in its genesis, a non-monastic form, non-celibate form of working with the energies of the body and the mind in order to bring about an awakening of our true potential. So this is why we often see Padmasambhava, uh, either with his Indian consul Mandalava, who was actually uh, really his teacher, she was the daughter of a uh, king, and uh, was on deep meditative retreat when, when they first met. So why is that important? It's because in this case, let's say Tsopema, as the Tibetans refer to it, um, is considered one of the preeminent power places uh, in the Tibetan tradition. Pilgrims will go there uh, in order to uh, essentially tap into that energetic of um, Padmasambhava and Mandarava and the myths and narratives that developed around their their practice at that place and the transformation that occurred. It's a, it's, it's a beautiful story alone of that uh, relationship and how it developed and how it transformed that whole kingdom. But again, just because of time, I won't go into it here, but I wanted to just bring, to stress the importance of these powerful places in the mountains, Udiana in this case, uh, that became in a certain sense, the cradle of, of Vajrayana. So here we see Padmasambhava on the left in his a envisioned paradise called Sangdo Pelri, the copper colored mountain uh, that in a certain sense became his uh, associated and there were their practices, meditative practices in which the, the, the classic one, the seven line prayer in which one seeks to identify with Padmasambhava energetically as one's own nature, because it's very, very clear that as in the Tantra, the Hindu Tantra, you know, Bhairava is not separate from our own, it's our own true nature. So the same is true with Padmasambhava that rises in our heart center and is simply an anthropomorphic uh, manifestation of our own fully awakened nature. So here in this kind of paradisical realm, um, and then on the right, what we see is a wall painting, a detail from a Tibetan wall painting of Shambhala. So Shambhala, of course, we've all heard of as a kind of legendary Buddhist paradise somewhere lost you know, beyond the Himalayas. Um, many, many uh, people have gone off historically in search of it. Nicholas Rorick, of course, from the Kula Valley being one. Um, and uh, but depicted in very much the same way as the kind of Buddha paradises were. So here, what we're seeing with Padmasambhava on the left is a kind of reconfiguration, if you will, of the Sukhavati, the land of bliss um, that we saw with the other opening slide, which is something in the Pure Land tradition of Buddhism. One can sort of meditate oneself into that state, which is a meditative state, um, as opposed to being something that one could ever find on on Earth. And the same is true, of course, with uh, Rinpoche's or Thomas and Bhagas, pop, uh, copper colored mountain here, and Shambhala too has been notoriously elusive. But all of this goes to really back to the very roots of, of Tantric Buddhism in Tibet from the eighth century when Thomas and Bhagas was invited to come to Tibet to bring teachings that it was felt would be more appropriate and more effective in uh, Tibetan context than the more pacifist, renunciatory model uh, that we have in the early Theravada Buddhist traditions in India, for example. So this is a, a real power place, if you will, in Tibet called Terdrum, literally the, the place of treasures. And on this mountain that you see in front, not there's a temple on the right, uh, but in the mountain front near the top of it, you can see a, a um, Actually, you can see the cave uh, from the summit. And then if you go to the right, you'll see another little mound. And then in between them, you'll see a, a cave. And this is the cave that's important because it's a, a, a place where uh, Padmasambhava's uh, Tibetan consort, uh, Yeshe Son, they practiced together there. And he introduced her to the practices of inner heat, Tumo. And there she stayed, according to the narratives you know for many many years until realizing awakened fully and became a living female buddha the first in tibet through the practice of inner heat and Padmasambhava also stayed there trained with her 
uh, in those initial period, but in the end, she was was on her own in this incredibly powerful place. So not only was this a place where the first, let's say, close disciple of Padmasambhava, who came from Udhyana, uh, attained enlightenment, but it was also the place where um, many treasures were said to have been revealed in the rocks, in the landscape, and continue to be revealed today by great adepts who may go there and stay and meditate in that cave, for example, and then receive a kind of transmission that's imprinted within the landscape. So this is that cave closer up as I'm approaching it. You have to kind of do a really quite tricky traverse across the rock. And there you can see the cave. And then there's a ladder uh, from a notched log that goes up further uh, into the recesses of the cave. And this is where uh, Yeshe Sogyal is said to have spent um, a number of years perfecting her practice of inner heat. This is a llama that I went with on that occasion up to the cave. Um, and what we see here, I mean, most of you are certainly well aware in the Tibetan tradition of the maroon robed monks, such as what uh, the robes that His Holiness the Dalai Lama wears. But in the tantric tradition, <clears throat> uh, which is less, uh, less, less visible, let's say, in the Tibetan Buddhist world, <clears throat> if you, if you wear the red and white shawl and the red and white representing the white, the, the male element and the red, the female element. And this indicates that this is a path of, a path of transformation and integration as opposed to one of renunciation of the dynamic polarity in which all of nature and reality uh, partakes. So this is another power place uh, in Bhutan. This is actually after Yeshe Sogyo, uh, Parmasambhava's consort after she uh, trained intensely in the yogas of inner heat. Uh, then Parmasambhava said, now you must travel across the Himalayas uh, to meet your destined consort, Atse Tsale, uh, which she did uh, in Nepal. And then they traveled together to, um, to what's now Bhutan, uh, Drukyul, the land of the thunder dragon. And there was a cave where this small hermitage here, which is called um, uh, Singipuk, uh, the lioness cave, uh, practiced here with her consort, uh, in, and this has become a very, very uh, place of pilgrimage on the way up to the more well-known Tiger's Nest Monastery, uh, which this is a place that one passes en route to that. And again, in Bhutan, which is a very powerful uh, land in its own right, simply because it is the last of the remaining Himalayan Buddhist kingdoms. And one sees <clears throat> throughout the landscape there, these uh, images, in this case, painted on rock of uh, form of Vajrayogini, which is a form of a kind of enlightened, uh, representing kind of enlightenment uh, energies, uh, standing in front of a, of a cave of a and the idea is that these were kind of the initiatrices. They were the guardians of the sacred places, both within our bodies and as well as within the landscape. And they're often depicted, as you'll see or hear, even though it's kind of more an abstracted image, uh, sort of dressed in the charnel ground ornaments uh, and representing their nature as being ones sort of on the wild fringes of, uh, of conventional reality. This also from just in my more recent trip to, um, to Bhutan, this is a cave uh, behind a waterfall that's said to lead into, um, into one of these kind of Dakini paradises. And this is in the valley called Chimpu, which is also called the, the Valley of Lodagini. So here we see uh, Vajrayogini, or in this case, Vajrabarahi, who is the manifestation of uh, Vajrayogini. And she's distinctive because of the sow's head that will appear, that appears at the top uh, of the right part of her head as a symbolic gesture of the transformation of, of ignorance into enlightened awareness. And it's this deity that one uh, identifies with in the practice of the yogas of inner and inner heat. So here we see again, just images. I wanted to just show a few from the Tibetan and Bhutanese tradition of this idea of nature itself, kind of in this sense, uh, anthropomorphized, or in this case, really a snow lion's head uh, appearing uh, in rock. And then a yogi, uh, again, long haired and red and white, uh, uh, rather than pure red robes of a monk, uh, pulling, uh, 
a Buddha image that had been concealed in the rock. So some of these power places are gone to because they not only are places in which one receives the blessing of the great sages and saints who may have meditated there before, but also because they contain literal treasures. So my interest in all of this when I was living in Kathmandu was connected to the actual uh, texts, so they call terma, their treasure texts that were connected with the hidden lands. I became fascinated by the idea that there were places in nature that were somehow uh, where the veils were thin, there were kind of intermediary realms between the physical and the spiritual worlds. And the more I learned about them and learned how difficult they were to reach and how far away one had to travel to find them, um, the more I became fascinated. So this is at a remote monastery in uh, the Manaslu region of, um, of Nepal uh, and with the uh, custodian librarian, as it were there, uh, with his young apprentice, uh, bringing out some texts that talk about these, uh, that speak about this tradition of the hidden lands and how they can become supports for contemplative practice and ideal places for pilgrimage. This is the text um, that, one second here, um, that sorry, my screen is covering this, so I have to, one minute. Um, but this is from one of the earliest texts attributed to Padmasambhava called the Outer Pass Key to the Hidden Lands. And this was revealed from a scroll <clears throat> from the 14th century by a Lama Rinchen Godemchen. And <clears throat> as Padmasambhava is is quoted in this text from Rinchen Godemchen, 14th century. It says, those who contemplate journeying to the hidden lands often fall prey to their doubts and lack the requisite courage, while those who are overly pious um, fail to, to open the way to these secret places. Um, <clears throat> sorry, it's my, it's partly covered for some reason in my computer screen. But anyway, for, for, for the auspicious circumstances to enter, for those who lack the auspicious circumstances to enter the hidden lands, they will remain as imagined paradises. They will not manifest simply through idle talk. So that's, of course, a, a disclaimer for our own um, this presentation right now, because um, at the same time, I think it's a very powerful quote, and it really speaks to this idea that when we seek to enter these hidden lands, they are not places that we can rely simply upon our imagination or what we read about them or what we think about them, but they really do somehow demand of us this very dynamic engagement with the circumstances of our lives. Um, and often as it was traditionally with, with wild nature. And here we see a number of different images um, from the Tibetan tradition. In this case, a Dakini protectress um, hovering above a waterfall where one of these tertan or treasure revealers has brought out texts uh, that were concealed behind the waterfall that will reveal uh, the ways of um, approaching the hidden lands and then other different images that speak to this tradition so here we see uh, also some further images that that uh, address the issue of hidden lands they often have the dakini guardians we see one here the white buddha dakini in the upper right uh, with her requisite skull cup and her flaying knife, again, ornament uh, objects associated with charnel grounds, with cremation grounds. And so, again, speaking to how the importance that the charnel ground represents in um, signifying a place in which one can overcome the conventional boundaries between life and death and enter into a more inclusive uh, sense of reality. So, this is a quote from a book which I'm very fond of by Simon Shama called Landscape and Memory, um, which is obviously not talking about hidden land tradition in the Himalayas, but I find it a very resonant quote for myself personally, and where he writes, there have always been two kinds of Arcadia, shaggy and smooth, dark and light, a place of bucolic leisure and a place of primitive panic, the idyllic as well as the wild. So that speaks to me simply because it really addresses what we see in the hidden land literature in the Tibetan tradition, where these hidden lands are not uh, necessarily described as paradises in the sense of infinite ease and 
comfort and places one can relax, et cetera, but places that challenge us on the most deepest level. And that's why they become landscapes of awakening. They become source supports and supports for our own uh, emergence from that which has limited and hindered us into that which can free us. And that we see very dynamically depicted in this representation of Padmasambhava uh, on the right in his eighth manifestation, riding on the back of a tigress um, in this very wild and dynamic form that Trungpa Rinpoche referred to as representing crazy wisdom. So in other words, when circumstances become so challenging in the world, one can only embrace it through uh, a kind of fearlessness that is symbolized by this idea of dancing on the back of a pregnant tigress. So I just wanted to kind of bring that up in the sense that when we talk about the geography of enlightenment, we're not talking about the geography of paradise in the way we might conventionally think about it. So here, uh, this was my teacher, Chatra Rinpoche, uh, Chatra Sangye Dorje Rinpoche, who passed away only a few years ago at the age of 102. And um, when I was first in Nepal, um, I came when I was 19 years old and learned about these hidden lands. And when I was apprenticing as a to learn Tibetan scroll painting, tanka painting up in the Kumbu region and learned about these places, as my teacher then told me, that were very difficult to reach and yet were places in which enlightenment could be attained. And so, of course, that really captured my teenage mind at the time. And I went and I met at that same time Chato Rinpoche. Uh, here he's depicted uh, in front of his uh, hermitage in Parping outside the Kathmandu Valley. And I asked him about hidden lands. And he said to me, uh, just looked at me and just said, can you spend a month alone? And I said, yes, if there was a reason to do so. He says, okay, well, come back when you have a month free, and then I'll send you a hidden, hidden land, and then you won't have to ask me what a hidden land is. You'll know for yourself through your direct experience. So that was quite a challenge, um, and but I was able to manage to um, take a semester. I was in, at that time, I was at Oxford, um, doing my first degree there, an MA in English literature, but I took a semester off and um, went back to Nepal and took off work from the work that I was then doing in, 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 uh, in Nepal and arranged uh, with his guidance to go up to a hidden land called Pemtang, which you can see on the left. This was a very remote valley at the upper reaches of the Mlemchi Kolo River uh, before Langtang, and you had to come over that pass that you see uh, in the center of the slide. And that was my mandate. I was to go there and spend a month. <laughs> and so that's sort of where all of this research for me began. And as Dr. Sonali said, for me, it would never have been satisfying to just refer to the texts and have them translated and analyzed and interpret what they mean, but actually to experience what these places are uh, in a more direct way. So a book that I wrote called The Heart of the World that Dr. Sonali also uh, referenced is, is about those experiences that I had in going to and spending months at, in a number of different uh, hidden lands. And um, so if that's something that any of you are interested in, you can look for that book. But in what I wanted to do in the remaining time, which of course isn't a lot, is to just give a kind of visual pilgrimage into this world of power places and hidden lands and pure realms and uh, really bringing more attention to this um, aspect of Tibetan Buddhism that is less known, which is the tantric tradition. Here again, we see Ani Riksang and her student Pasang Lamo um, in their red and white shawls with the meditation belt um, that they wear underneath them. Those would be the meditation belts they'd wear in meditation, as well as in the practice of inner heat, tumo. We see the same in the yogi on the right, so this quest of mine kind of continued uh, into what was considered the greatest of the so-called hidden lands called Pemaku, land arrayed like a lotus, which now lies, and it's considered to be the body of that goddess, uh, Vajavarahi. And uh, above the belt, as it were now, is the, the McMahon line and the line of control in Arunachal Pradesh. And this is just south of the line of what was traditionally the line of control. And now the, uh, in uh, the Yangsang Valley, which is a tributary to the Xiang River, which of course is the name of the, uh, the Tsangpo after it enters into Arunachal Pradesh from Tibet. 
out of the Sangpa gorges and before it merges and becomes essentially the Brahmaputra in Assam. So this is with the Idu Mishmi um, family that I stayed with uh, in following some of these Tibetan texts into what I'd hoped. Uh, and according to the, the, the prophecies in the text would be the Yangsang Pemaku, the innermost secret place in the Pemaku region. And so in the book that I mentioned, the um, heart of the world, His Holiness very kindly wrote the introduction to the book. And this is where he writes that hidden lands are not places to escape the world, but to enter it more deeply. The qualities inherent in such sacred places reveal the interconnectedness of all life and deepen awareness of the hidden regions of the mind and spirit. Visiting such places with a good motivation and appropriate merit, the pilgrim can learn to see the world differently from the way it commonly appears. So this was kind of my, um, yeah, the view that I took as for many years, I became rather obsessed about finding and going and visiting as many of these hidden lands as I could and staying there and meditating. This is the, on the way to a hidden land called Kimalong uh, in the Manaslu region of Nepal. Uh, and you can see the valley on the upper right. I stayed in a, there in a cave for, for a month. And uh, then on the way down afterwards, this is a group of, of uh, pilgrims who were traveling to a temple in a lower region outside of that valley itself. This is entering into this extraordinary valley called Kimalong. Uh, there were these series of entry chortans or stupas that you had to pass through in order to enter into what was considered the, the sacred land. And here again on the right, pilgrims having passed through that gate and portal approaching the small monastery temple at its center. And again, places of how these function within the sociology of the Himalayas, they were places um, where in this case, these pilgrims were going to receive teachings from the then abbot, Chikinima, uh, but it was also places where just the blessings of the place were powerful and palpable. One could go there to make prayers, one could go there to meditate. So they became, in a certain sense, these kind of uh, quintessential uh, power places, if you will. Um, I don't know why the screen is kind of dissolving the way it is. It wasn't meant to set up that way. But anyway, uh, here we see in Gokyo Lake and uh, the Kumbu Valley in, in Nepal. This is um, also uh, an area considered to be a, a hidden land. Uh, so when the Sherpas, meaning the Sharipa, meaning people from the east, migrated into uh, the Kumbu region of Nepal, um, they were following prophecies uh, that they would find a hidden land where they would be uniquely prosperous, which of course they really were. So again, uh, this is the easternmost terminus of the Himalayan range, a peak called Namche Barwa, a massif actually called Namche Barwa. And this comprises the um, uh, one of the sides of the, the, the Tsangpo Gorge, which the Guinness Book of World Records designates as one of the contenders for being the world's deepest. And on the other side of the gorge is, the Gallop, is a peak called Galapelri, which we'll see in a moment. And in between is this incredibly serpentine gorge uh, that uh, is held to be the central channel, if you will, energy channel of the goddess Vajabarahi, uh, whose um, body forms the terrestrial landscape of this of this hidden land called Pemaku. So this is, according to text, considered the great the greatest of all these hidden lands and um, most difficult to reach. So of course it became a great object of my fascination. And uh, you can see where it's located at the very um, eastern edge of the Himalayan range, where the Tsangpo River makes a great bend around that peak, Namchibarwa, and then flows down through Assam and. Uh, through the Gulf of uh, Bengal, uh, into the Gulf of Bengal. So here we see the apex of that, uh, of the Tsangpo River as it makes its great bend around a sacred peak here called Abu Lashu, which means literally it's a protector deity uh, manifest as this mountain. And so the pilgrim who would enter in from the north, uh, from the Tibet side into the Pemaka region, first has to cross the Tsangpo River here and uh, avoid the wrath of this rather uh, dynamic deity who is also depicted in other forms later as riding on a huge kind of uh, Himalayan python. But what's important here is we see this, the whole realm of Pemaku is uh, held to be the, the sacred land of Padmasambhava, uh, blessed by Padmasambhava and the 
uh, mountain Galapuri, which I was mentioning, which forms the north side of the gorge, uh, we can see to the right. It was also considered to be, he came from the great land Diana, but from the already from the 12th, 13th century, it was not a place where pilgrims could travel any longer because of the Muslim invasions. And as a result, when Pemaku became to the fore, it was held to be uh, equivalent to Udiana. So in other words, by going to this place on the peripheries, right on the periphery of Tibet, was held to be equivalent to connecting with the original uh, homeland of, of Papa Sambhava, of Udiana. So here we see another text from Padma Sambhava, uh, which is called Liberation Through the Great um, Hearing of the Great Blissful Land of Pemaka. Um, just hearing about the great blissful Buddha realm of Pemaka opened the path to enlightenment. There is no mention, no need to mention the benefit of actually going there. So this is again, this speaks to this idea that these these were not places that were just to be imagined in solitary contemplation, with their active imagination, vis uh, creative visualization, but places that one could actually go to. And when by going to, certain kind of transformative experiences would arise. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Not sure. PowerPoint's acting up. So here we see the great band of the Songpo with Nanchi Barwa at over 25,000 feet and Gyalapauri at nearly 24,000 feet. Uh, framing this great gourd, the Tsangpo, as seen here in a satellite image. This is a map of that same area uh, that I made after several of my trips uh, into the Pamukka region on Tibet's side, but again, trying to illustrate the, um, the different uh, power places, if you will, uh, within Pamukka, because the way the texts describe it, as one travels down the river, one's traveling through the uh, from Namchibarwa here at the north, uh, one's traveling down through the body of this goddess, Vajavarahi. And they actually describe how in the text, Gyalapauri, the peak here that we see to the left, has this sort of distinctive snout, that, uh, like a sow snout at the very top. And that's held to be symbolic of the, the, the snout that we see here in this uh, early statue of, of uh, Vajavarahi, Dorji Pamo. And again, the texts also describe how moving through the landscape, one's moving through the chakras, the energy centers of one's own body, awakening them as they are become into dynamic resonance with the chakras that exist actually within the outer landscape. So here we see that um, in this depiction again of uh, Galapari to the far right, as the river now, as it's coming towards us, is flowing down in towards Arunachal Pradesh uh, through this very, very lush subtropical forests. And I traveled there several times on this route, but in one time with Ani Riksang, who you saw in an earlier image uh, with her disciple, uh, Ani Pasang, uh, Pasang Lamo, and here on pilgrimage, uh, heading down the Tsangpa River towards the Indian border. So you can see some of the, how rugged the terrain is. Uh, this is looking down into the depths of the gorge with Namchi Barwa Massif behind. And then as to look at the full spectrum of this landscape representing the goddess, the tantric goddess Vajavarahi, uh, it comes to down into uh, Arunachal Pradesh. So this is about 20 miles, perhaps, across the border into Arunachal Pradesh from the line of control. And uh, this is in the so-called Yangsang Pemaka Valley, so the innermost secret Valley of Pamukkha, which is, is associated with, uh, as it says literally in the text, with Vajavarahi's secret place, meaning her womb. And this is the place where there's a sort of symbolic rebirth takes place. This is one of the small monastery temples that's been built in that area, and the Yangsang Chu watershed. And the, one of the, this area of Pamukkha was opened much later than the upper, upper Pamukkha, if you will. Uh, so Ugin Dorji Dranak was one of the early uh, Tibetan lamas, and you see here an image of him on the left, uh, where he opened these lower valleys to Tibetan settlement. And as he wrote, Aho, the secret land of Pemaka, pure realm for the Buddhas of past, present, and future. Just thinking of this place, I become joyful. Crystal glaciers adorn the sky, 
Rain falls like nectar from the gods, and rainbows fill the valleys, walled round by snow peaks, cliffs, and jungle. This hidden land of Padmasambhava is a place where fortunate beings can find enlightenment. So this is, um, sorry, one of the great uh, lamas who traveled into this region in a certain sense, seeking enlightenment, uh, was this uh, incredibly charismatic figure uh, who was a contemporary of the sixth Dalai Lama in the um, late 18th century and, uh, sorry, in the, in the late 17th century and early 18th century. But he wrote uh, a travelogue, if you will, uh, called The Delightful True Stories of the Hidden Land of Pemaku, uh, where he wrote about, again, what I was mentioned in that, that quote from Simon Shama, where he talks about two kinds of Arcadia. So that's echoed in what Leilong Shepi Dorji writes here, saying that there's a constant menace here from poisonous snakes, leeches, flies, clawed and long-snouted animals with fangs, dangerous wild men and vicious savages. One can easily succumb to fever and gout while blisters, abscesses, ulcers, and sores add to the physical obstacles. Those without courage or those with lingering doubts, too many mental conceptions who are strongly attached to conventional appearances who are out of ignorance fall into accepting and rejecting. Such people will have difficulty reaching this land and getting through unscathed. So I think it is sort of a wonderful quote that speaks to at least some of what his experience was already several hundred years ago. But traveling through that same region, uh, and my hosts were delightful, uh, the, what he would call the vicious savages, were in this case the headman of this particular village of Singa uh, in Rigzin Dorji. Interestingly enough, uh, an Idu Mishni, but had taken a Tibetan name. Again, showing the incredible sort of overlap between the indigenous um, animistic traditions and the Tibetan kind of visionary uh, traditions of seeking in these same wild places uh, gates into a paradisical state, whether geographical or uh, psychological. So this is, um, again, different uh, Idu Mishmis who were kind of our guides, as it were, into this and hosts in this valley. And, uh, but again, as Leilong Shepidorji's text indicated, it was a place full of uh, very potentially dangerous snakes, uh, lots of Himalayan pit vipers, also Russell's viper. Um, not this is a Himalayan pit viper, however, on the left. So there's an interesting image from 14th century uh, wall painting in Plancourt in France showing Adam and Eve uh, standing next to the tree of knowledge, interestingly depicted as a mushroom with spots on it, which would indicate Amanita muscaria, but with a snake uh, encircling it. And I just put that in there in the sense that you know every form of paradise, Eden included, was considered to be a place of of both hazard and opportunity in the sense that there's the snake in the garden, but also the sense of powerful plants and plant magic, because this is something very much, uh, obviously it's central to the whole myth of Eden, eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, but it's also central to uh, many aspects of the, the tradition of hidden lands. So when a couple of the different trips into the Arunachal Pradesh side of um, of Pemaku. I was traveled with a Bhutanese uh, doctor, uh, traditional doctor and plant collector, Amshi Sherab Tenzing. And here we are sort of inspecting some unusual plants that are held to have extraordinary medicinal properties. And often some of them, as the text described, to be harvested only under certain conditions of phases of the moon or under the lights of rainbows, as you see in the upper left. So again, it's sort of a magical world uh, connected with magical beings that we see here. And um, I'm gonna skip ahead a bit because it's these, but actually as the text also described, it said all, all women in the hidden land of Pemaku are can, can be considered as emanations of the goddess of, of uh, Dekinis. And here we see, these are actually from uh, women from the, uh, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, from a different, which subsect of that, the, um, and anyway, not from the not from the Mishnis, but the um, uh, I will come to me in a moment. But anyway, out collecting medicinal herbs, and um, so the whole thing is is extraordinary that way. It's connected. This is Boyuk uh, from from that local tribe, 
uh, which is in the lower valleys, lower than where the Idu Nishin are, are located. So uh, an extraordinary realm. This is again going back into the up. This is in the Tibetan side of Pemaka. And just going to see. I don't, I know I was meant to leave plenty of time for questions and answers. I think I've already spoken for 50 minutes. I'll go don't, for another 10. Don't worry, Ian. Just take your time. Okay. All right. Good enough. So uh, this was kind of this introduction to this extraordinary realm. And um, this is from a series of trips that I then made into trying originally to reach the heart of Pemaku, the young song or innermost secret part of, of Pemaku from, uh, from the north and traveling down into, as we saw from, this is actually in the footsteps of Leilun Shepi Dorji, where he described this extraordinary hardship. And of course, it really was that way. We had a lot of difficulty. A lot of times there were no trails at all, um, but extraordinary compelling but after a series of trips, we did reach the point where we were trying to get into the innermost part of the Songpo Gorge. There was a section that, um, by all Western accounts, no one had ever reached. Um, and that was based upon an expedition made in 1924 by Frank King Ward and Lord uh, Jack Cordor, uh, who attempted to kind of close what had been referred to as the gap. And uh, <clears throat> they also were made aware of some of, of Tibetan texts describing a series of momentous waterfalls in that 10 mile gap. But this is the furthest point that they were able to reach and which we then reached, you know, nearly a, a century later, um, traveling with the Lama in this case is shown there on this little promontory, but you can kind of see the conditions do not make it very amenable to continuing down river from this point. Uh, and I'll, I'll get back to some of that in a bit. <clears throat> but these are just some of the uh, remote, uh, I wouldn't really call it a monastery because they're very proud of the fact, actually, in Pemaka, they say, no, no monks are allowed here because they're actually really representing the earliest Nyingma tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, which was based on householder yogins. And that was directly modeled upon the life and lifestyle, if you will, of Padmasambhava, who was non celibate with consort. And so this is the abbot of one place um, there that we visited and uh, they brought out the masks and so they a lot of the traditions that we associate with monasteries in tibetan buddhist tradition are still there but they're done within a tradition in which the house or all our householder yogins farmers uh whatever else they may be uh, but then they gather together at the the temple uh, during particular phases of the moon for particular ceremonies and practices Okay, sorry, my computer's freezing here for some reason. Um, okay, so that's again uh, depicting images in the monastery there. This is going back to the image you saw before of the gorge. Um, and again, other ways in which it becomes very difficult to travel through. I mentioned the guardian deity of uh, the Tsangpo Gorge is called Dorji Traksin and how he was represented in a, a mountainous form uh, called the Abulashu, which was at the at the apex of the great uh, bend of the Tsangpo. But here we see him depicted in a, in a painting form, riding, as I mentioned, kind of what would appear to be kind of an enormous Himalayan python, but almost if more like an anaconda. But these are, again, the guardians that one is to take into account uh, when one travels through the hidden land. So the first gate, as it's referred to in the text, is the outer gate. And that outer gate represents taking certain precautions. In this case, you cut a stick uh, with a notch for every year of your life, and then you place it at this, this auspicious place. You go up this little log ladder, and uh, you place your ear against a hole in the rock where you may receive prophecies from the yoginis, uh, guardians of the the Tsangpo Gorge, telling you either to turn back or welcoming you on or remaining silent as they were in my case. And uh, one goes, hopes for the best and continues on. But in a certain sense, one's entering into a kind of magic list as one at the same time is entering into extremely uh, wild uh, terrain, such as a trail that consisted of a rotting notched log going up a vertical moss encrusted cliff with a 
bamboo stick as a kind of railing of sorts and bringing all of our gear up the ladders. And also crossing on, again, uh, over great abysses on wet, slick rocks. And then sometimes where there were no trails at all coming down uh, through these moss encrusted uh, cliffs interlaced with waterfalls. So this is again, Leilong Shepidorji, who we uh, quoted from earlier, but what he writes in this wonderful account of his journey from the 18th century, 1729, is that when journeying to these sacred places, fear naturally transforms into great splendor and one remains perfectly at ease. A new spiritual awareness flares up in one stream of consciousness, a conception free unity of bliss and emptiness. So this is a beautiful kind of account of how the contemplative attitude, a particular, what in Tibetan you would also call danang, a pure vision, um, it supersedes over the kind of uh, normal sense of hardship and frustration and succumbing to danger and all of that that might otherwise in an ordinary sense uh, come to play in such uh, you know, wild conditions. So I, I think it's a beautiful example of how the contemplative and the active poles, if you will, of, of life come to come together through in the active uh, engagement with hidden lands in the act of pilgrimage or in the act of uh, just this kind of tantric travel, if you will, in which one is taking a certain frame of mind uh, alters how one experiences uh, uh, what we would often consider to be objective reality. But we recognize then that it's a, it's the emerger of the subjective and the objective. So here, uh, certain uh, this is one of the main passes into this realm of, of there there were great rivers one had to cross here. Spent two days trying to make a bridge across this one. Uh, rescued ultimately as we came down, we'd run out of food. My hunter brought us back to villages um, with you know, all kinds of you know, wild poisonous plants and mushrooms and snakes. And just to give a sense of the wildness of this area, this is on the first trip to Pemaku. And we came eventually to this village. Uh, and we looking at the Tsangpo River here as it's flowing south towards. Yeah. So again, just some of the villagers from that area, children dressed in animal skins, uh, wild lynxes, uh, wild harvesting wild bananas, really a magical world. Here, almost like a Gauguin image uh, from the Southeast, children bathing naked in waterfalls, really was a kind of paradisical uh, world. And yet still, the inner gate remained and the secret gate remained to travel into the very, very hidden core of uh, Pemaku. So I'm going to go through these again because of time. Uh, Bakutuku uh, Pema Tenzin Rinpoche was a great um, source of information about how to travel through the hidden lands. He was a senior uh, disciple of my teacher, Chatra Rinpoche, and he's now in Pemaku itself on the Arunachal Pradesh side. I literally just saw some photographs yesterday from his current, now he's much older, uh, and was carried into a palaquin, into what's now the womb of the goddess. So extraordinary how the place becomes, is remains very, very active and dynamic. So this is this lower region. On this trip to gain, to enter the inner gate, you have to travel to a mountain called Kundodor Sempatrang, the citadel of Vajrasattva on the border between central India and Tibet, China. And involved crossing over a pass here called the um, uh, from the Pomi Valley in Tibet uh, over the Dashingla Pass. Here we're traveling with a, with a lama as well as with a, a nun you see here, Tibetan nun, <clears throat> crossing over snowfields, over rivers, uh, on cables, and uh, over passes. And this is where the attendant uh, of the of the lama shown here, through wild bamboo forests over these high altitude marshes in order to reach, finally, the first time we could see the mountain, you can see depicted on the far right, uh, this anvil shaped peak surrounded by eight lakes. So like a mandala at the heart center of the goddess as it's described in the texts. So here is where key will, will emerge. And so the text that we were following to reach here, which is called the Guide to the Heart Center, the All Gathering Palace, Kundu, which means Kundu, Dorsempotrang, that liberates upon seeing, 
He said, whoever washes and drinks from this lake can purify lifetimes of, of karma uh, defilements and pacify the obstacles and disturbances of this life. So these are kind of how the texts help to frame and alter uh, how we perceive the, the objective reality, if you will, uh, as a kind of intermediary world in which the outer and the, the inner are kind of interpenetrating. And as the text says, the most fortunate beings will perceive the deities here directly. Others will hear their voices. Ordinary beings will see only earth and rock. Of course, the latter was my case and resorted to Photoshop just to create an image that indicates what those who would directly perceive the deity of this place, which is Vajrasattva in union, the consort holding the bell in the Vajra, sort of the, icon, the preeminent icon, if you will, of Vajrayana Buddhism, uh, Vajrasattva, the, the, the Vajra being, here depicted uh, at the, on this face of extraordinary rock face uh, coming down from the citadel, literally the palace of Vajrasattva. Here with the Lama that we were traveling with, <clears throat> we reached the cliff where the key is meant to be revealed. Um, there's a whole chapter dedicated to that in my book, The Heart of the World, uh, on the key. But uh, so I won't go into that now. But uh, our then we continue to travel from the heart center down to the navel center of the goddess, and we're greeted by a, a rainbow uh, coming right to the monastery as we entered out of the forest. So kind of these kind of cool things continued to happen. In <clears throat> Pemico, which really reinforced this idea that one was no longer in kind of ordinary time and space. This is the manifestation of Padmasambhava called the um, Rangri Gyalpo, the self king of self arising uh, awareness, depicted with a Vajra, a magical uh, dagger, a Purba, um, <clears throat> at, the, at that temple. And we see here, as depicted in the navel of the um, of the, the goddess in this extraordinarily fertile uh, um, valley surrounded by, by hills. And then you can actually see it over the top, the, the peak of Kundu Dosampatram, the, uh, the citadel of Vajrasattva in the far distance, but it was about two days walk down from there to, to where, you, you, where we see where this is situated. Um, and then crossing out of payment will always involve crossing over high passes back into Tibet proper. So just lastly, I'll just spend a few minutes going to the secret gate because all of this was, according to the text, <clears throat> a necessary procedure to uh, approach the, the innermost gate of Pemaku. And that is, as we see from that 1924 expedition that I ref um, referenced to Frank Kingdon Ward and Lord Corder, they left the section between A and B <clears throat> unexplored, and there were no accounts of what was in between there except for a, t a text that they did. He wrote about in his book, uh, The Riddle of the Songpo Gorges, from that 1924 expedition, referring to a series of waterfalls, and one of which was meant to lead into the innermost uh, secret realm of Pemaku. So, this big main a blank spot on the map of world exploration, even by the time the end of the 20th century. So, it became rather compelling to me, and National Geographic was very kind in supporting uh, a final expedition in which we were able to reach that point, which I'll show in a moment. But the other thing that's very interesting about what satellite imagery provided by National Geographic could provide is that when you look at what that area, what's hidden there, um, how it looks like, you know, one of those kind of uh, early kind of salt images in the, in the Celtic landscapes of early Britain, but it's in the Tibetan text, it's this takin, this rather mystical animal unique to the Eastern Himalayas and Bhutan and Pemaka region that is said to be able also to guide one into the hidden land. So there's this sort of this strange parallel between magical plants, magical animals, and magical landscape. This is the takin in Bhutan, very, very extraordinary animal. <clears throat> So here we are trying to go down into the confluence again of the uh, the called the Po Tsangpo River as it flows into the Tsangpo, which then merges as it flows across the borders into India. It becomes the Siang and the Brahmaputra. <clears throat> again, this is the apex of the of the this great bend as it's referred to as the Tsangpo River. <clears throat> 
and then heading down. Uh, then we had to reach points where we could only cross the Tsangpo on a, this kind of cable uh, and with ropes and pulling everything across, all of our gear. And there are other areas as we travel deeper into the gorge, into the zone area that had been left as a blank spot. You know, we had brought caving ladders with us, climbing ropes, and this is my brother on that trip, rappelling down these slick rocks. But the trouble was, when we got to that point, all of our porters said, there's no way. So we were forced to, to return, we couldn't get into that area. We, the Lama who was with us performed a chid ceremony to appease any local spirits we might have offended in our assault, as it were, on this, on this um, unknown part of the gorge. Um, also with Ani Riksang, uh, who I traveled with earlier, returned uh, on the next expedition to try to find an alternative way into that hidden core of the, the Songpo Gorge. And so we approached that from another direction, according to, to what the text indicated. This is the head man of that village who said that by no uncertain means should we try to go up that valley. And uh, there were many reasons against it. First of all, was this head wall of ice and rock. Um, and then before that were apparently trees that, you know, if it rained they, and the water fell on you, you your whole body would break out in uh, unendurable blisters and rashes. And anyway, so it was, and first of all, the cable bridge going across to it, crossing the Tsangpo, which apparently hadn't been used in years and was likely to collapse on, on use. So that had to be abandoned. Um, and so... Finally, however, we got back to the village that we had originally gone to with this Konchok Wombo, the Lama there, who had always said that there was no way into that um, sort of 10 mile gap. But he'd heard, you know, that the year before we'd gone to the to the heart of the Kundu de Sempatrang, the heart center of the Dekini. And he said, I see now that you're not, that you're insiders, in other words, you're Buddhists. And therefore, I will tell you that the text that I told you before had been lost does exist and that there is actually a description of a portal into the innermost hidden part of Pemaku down in the depths of the gorge. Uh, and so he ran, he read from the text and then described that uh, this would be a way that we would get into the section between A and B. Um, <clears throat> between those two falls was a third waterfall, as he was indicating from the text that behind that waterfall would be the portal into the innermost secret land. So that very rugged terrain, however, he said that there were animal trails that we could follow. Uh, so he sent us with two hunters. Uh, but this is kind of the terrain that we were sent up to. It's kind of Mordor looking and, you know, Lord of the Rings kind of terrain. And the animal trails going over the ridge turned out to be really tufts of grass that you would hold onto and try to avoid slipping down into the abyss. And then sometimes literally um, kind of batmanning down vines that were hanging down slabs of rock. This is one of our hunter guides. So what was extraordinary on this attempt is that suddenly, even though their Lama had said, yes, please take them uh, because they are Nangpa, they're insiders, suddenly everything missed it over. It was impossible to proceed. They said, no, 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 all the signs are inauspicious. We must turn back. But then just as that happened, suddenly, and there were three of these, and I took a picture of one because they're on different sides of us. Suddenly, these rainbow, uh, these circular rainbows appeared and with our own forms, as you can see, projected upon them. And they all, the hunters got down and prayed and prostrated. And they said this was a sign, a very auspicious sign of being entered into the, you know, into the hidden land. And as a result, and then suddenly they cleared in a way that they'd never seen. This is one of the wettest places on earth, highest rainfall anywhere on the planet. And suddenly it cleared and we could see down into the depths of this part of the gorge um, that they'd never seen before. This is actually where that horn of the Takin that I mentioned that you could see in the satellite image was actually representing here. So this is the area that we had to get down to and try to find this third waterfall. Um, but very difficult, lots of cliffs, um, barring the way, small waterfall that had been seen in 1924, but we needed to get to the area below that. We could see that there were some kind of hydraulic events below that, uh, but again, finding our way down there proved very tricky, having to rappel on ropes down into the, the depths of the gorge, looking for, in this case, really our objective was not the waterfall, although that really became the focus of the book that I subsequently wrote because it had been obsessive to the 
the British um, in the end of the, the 19th century. But we're looking for that, that doorway, that portal. So we're going down, we rappel down towards the base of the falls, we find a way uh, below, walking up. And here we see what literally was described as this oval shaped doorway, this being in the throat of the goddess. Um, and you can see the figure on the left looking across at that. And then this incredible you know, expanse of seething white water. Um, the scale is hard. You can see it a bit from the figure on the left, but on the right, I mean, that we estimated that to be about at least 25 feet up from the, the water line to where the, the, um, the, the, the oval doorway began, uh, which we estimated just roughly to be probably about 15 feet high, but no way to reach it. And those were the days before drones. They were days before, um, yeah, all kinds of things. And so that, however, what's interesting in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, this idea of, of uh, portals behind waterfalls and ways in which you enter through them contemplatively, like the figure depicted on the left in a 17th century mural in Tibet or a painting on the right, um, indicating ways in which you enter in literally into the sacred space, the awake, the place of enlightenment uh, at the heart of the mandala, represented here by the enlightened female Buddha, uh, Vajravarahi, um, which really is cannot be reached by ordinary means. And this is, again, where we speaks about Padma Sambhala and his eight manifestations uh, representing approaches to experience that are appropriate under different circumstances and here representing the um, crazy wisdom aspect where he rides with on the back of a pregnant tigress with eyes all over his body uh, in other words where vision is no longer simply looking straight ahead or behind or to the sides but it's everywhere at once this is sort of the non-dual reality uh, that is spoken about in the great perfection teachings of Dzogchen and Mahamudra. And we see this kind of visionary perception as being something that permeates uh, these highest levels of contemplative practice in Vajrayana Tantric Buddhism, even in forms like this that appear under in uh, against a, a blue sky, but sort of anticipating these are 17th century murals that almost anticipate 20th century abstract art based upon what are now recognized as entoptic phenomena. In other words, they are phenomena that appear within uh, the eye, and particularly within the retinal capillaries of the eye, uh, as one sees them projected against a, a deep blue background. So that's kind of what we see represented by the yogi on the right with this eye, in fact, that's their his own eye, as it were, projected into space before him. And I always a, a quote from the really the mystic poet, uh, William Blake, where he speaks about the eye altering alters all. And that does also speak to that kind of extraordinary collapsing of object of outer inner uh, dimensions of reality in the experience of the hidden land, which is hidden. It's always present, but it awakens to our experience when we overcome those conventional boundaries normally keep us in thrall to um outer appearances which are from this perspective illusory even though if they may point us towards that that greater sense of our full potential to be in full resonance with everything at once or as the tradition would call it outer inner and secret all could become uh, one single phenomena so the kala chakra tantra speaks of that in its context of places of pilgrimage are omnipresent they're everywhere the whole cosmos is a pilgrimage site as is so i'll just end with this quote from the 12th century great um, female uh, mahasiddha siddha rajni where she wrote don't seek an outer refuge the body itself is a divine mandala don't look elsewhere for the deity the mind itself unborn and unperishing is the ultimate buddha and teacher so i'll just end with that um that's the book that i was referencing which is uh, speaks about a series of these expeditions trying to kind of enter into the heart, as it were, of the, um, uh, the, the tradition of hidden lands. Okay, um, good. Okay, is my screen still shared or am I okay here now? Uh, you're okay, absolutely okay. Okay, good, very good. 
Well, thank you. I went a little bit over time there, but um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of give a visual odyssey, as it were, into the power places, hidden lands of um, you know the Himalayas and Tibetan Buddhist traditions. So, not if anybody all. has any. Okay. Good. Ian, it was such a wonderful talk. Um, hidden lands in Arunachal, the whole idea of Pemako, and um, the way in the end with uh, the last uh, quote that you read, that it's ultimately inside, and uh, we are always looking for things outside, and it's the inner temple, that's the secret, that uh, how the environment kind of helps you to get there, because ultimately it's inside of you. Um such a wonderful talk, uh, so, so required in today's world. Uh, one question I had um, was that with this fast-paced development that we are facing in these remote places, uh, how do you think the whole idea of the hidden lands uh, changes or uh, does it change at all? And how are the people who are aware of the hidden lands, how do they respond to this? Mm -hmm. I think very, as I mentioned, this Bakatuku Rinpoche, who under other ordinary circumstances is actually now based in New Mexico. But now at this very more advanced age of his life, he's decided to go back to Pemaku. So he's on the um, Arunachal Pradesh side of Pemaku right now, literally in that area, and has a large entourage that's followed him there. I would have liked to have put some images because I literally got them yesterday, but just didn't really have time to put them into the PowerPoint because it's again, it speaks exactly to what you're speaking about, is why would it be seen a place that's so difficult in many respects to reach, and especially in his age and mid-80s, mid uh, to go there in a, in a where he has to be carried in, but to perform these par prayers and, um, and uh, ceremonies in a place that's considered to have a certain, that whatever is done in such a place has a resonance and a power that is uh, amplifies uh, the effects that it, such a practice would have if it was done anywhere else. So that I think is speaks to the incredible power that these places are said to have. That same area of the Yangsang Pemaku on in the Arnachal side is now also a place where many many Bhutanese go on pilgrimage because they feel that they are actually able to tap into Padmasambhava's original, the spirit of Padmasambhava as expressed within landscape. So it's very active. It's very real. I mean, my hope always, of course, is that these kinds of ideas of sacred landscape would translate in more direct ways than they seem to into kind of environmental conservation, regeneration, renewal, because it's not always necessarily the case, as we know in any all throughout India, that pilgrims are the most, uh, you, know, the, you know, pollution uh, defilement of the of the landscape can still happen on one level, even if one's revering it on a theoretical level. So this kind of disconnect, I think, is something that I hope that lamas, for example, can bring more attention to that, you know, okay, this is a sacred landscape. It means, you know, you don't leave your plastic here. You don't leave your, this, you know, things are not. Uh... So that kind of deep sense that sometimes we can actually even see more in America in terms of how people interact with national parks, you know, sometimes you know, people are extremely conscious of the, uh, not all, of course, but there can be a deep, deep uh, uh, consciousness of, of the, to preserve the integrity of landscape, uh, even in a, let's say a Western secular context and just the value that, that John Muir, for example, began with the designation of national parks in America. So if something like that can also help to uh, be brought into, you know, the, the wonderful things we hear about the great Himalayan National Park in the Kulu area, for example, and even what you told me yesterday, uh, Dr. Sonali, which I thought was so wonderful, the tradition of the Somsi, you know, the Shamshi area where these magical uh, healing and rejuvenative plants are um, that that uh, I was looking into that a little bit and how villagers will go from the up uh, in the 20th day of the month of uh, what's I guess in August it falls in August and September uh, to collect these incredible plants many of which are psychoactive and they create a sewer they create an intoxicating liquor from that that is, is seems to be um, connected to the Soma tradition at least locally. So I found that fascinating, and that my, I think the mountain was called Maj Majhat or something. So maybe that, Majhat, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe that mountain, and maybe that uh, those plants are all within this great uh, Himalayan national park, which, in that sense, is showing exactly how 
uh, these traditions are are continuing today. Uh, but again, I think it's an ongoing question. I think that it's more and more important. The more we learn, you know, even the deepest levels of science, the how we are, you know, we are not separate from the outer. You know, we host the universe inside ourselves and our biome, and our biome is interconnected with that which we connect with externally. So the outer, the inner, the secret, which seem to be mystical ideas in tantric Buddhism, are actually just the reality of the way intangible and tangible dimensions of our lives all all intersect. So I think just that sensitivity where we don't see ourselves as separate from, from others and don't see ourselves separate from the environment is, uh, is something that hopefully will become ever more present within our educational systems and our lived experience uh, in life. Right. right. And uh, it's so important, uh, you know, like uh, I feel talking to locals, uh, that knowledge that has been passed on, and it's also in a hidden form that you kind of understand uh, what um, what are the subtle uh, uh, things that are said, which are not really spoken in clear form, but you have to understand just like the Bayouls are, that uh, how, how do you find them, uh, where they're located, and what does it tell you uh, to look within your own self? Um, another question that um, uh, Tara Hasnan, I'm not sure whether she's here now because she had to leave, uh, mm -hmm. But she left an, a number of questions for you. So I'm going to read out. Um, okay. uh, she uh, says, how does going to such a place and Pemaco transform you in your estimation? And what sort of daily practice do you try there? Plus, as a man who does one, how does one harness the Shakti female energies of such areas unless one goes with a female companion? So there are three questions that mm -hmm. she's asked. Right. Yeah. So... I'd say for, for the first trip into Pemaco, the daily practice that, you know, we followed the lead, of course, of our, um, of the, the hunter guides. And actually the, the route that we followed, followed trying to find Leilon Shepi Dorji, no one had done it, they said, for 50 years. So we were all on new ground. In fact, the trails that started out were no longer. But every evening uh, and every morning, the those we traveled with, the Tibetans, they did, it was called the Barche Lamsel. It's like a Rio Sangche. It's a, it's a um, a fire puja, a fire ceremony that we do with the bonfire that we had, which is of course what we cooked on as well, but with the uh, the offerings of local aromatic plants and shukpa, as it's called in Tibetan, so juniper boughs, with a, a prayer um, to Padmasambhava called a barche lamsel, meaning literally uh, removing obstacles on the path. And then the other practice was the Riwa Sangsha, which is the wild, literally Riwa, meaning wild mountain uh, offering of fragrant incense to the local spirits. And all of that was about clearing the obstacles, the outer, inner, and secret obstacles. In other words, those that are internal within us and within our own mind streams and those which are in the outer landscape. So that was a, a very clear uh, ritual that was done um, every morning and every evening. Uh, when there were no trails left and we didn't know which way to go, uh, we often did, did they would do divination uh, with mala to you know, do we go right, do we go left? I mean, it really was relying upon a kind of magical practices um, that were held, of course, by the tradition to be able to tap into a level of intuition uh, there where our conscious minds could not attain. When we reached, for example, a, a pass where we had no way to continue and the weather was such that there was no way to continue, when we, for three days we actually stayed in the cave and did practice. We did, in this case, the, the seven-line prayer to uh, Padmasambhava, again, to invoke some kind of, um, <clears throat> if you will, divine intervention. But the very fact that I was doing that is actually what gave confidence to the um, of those who we had essentially hired as our porters to continue because they felt oh, we were all kind of in the same vein. They didn't see us as kind of outsiders who were necessarily, you know, just trying to, uh, yeah, to penetrate into the innermost reaches of their sacred land. So that brought us into an extraordinary sense of harmony uh, with each other and with the land because we were all seeking to tap into something beyond uh, what our own rational minds could offer as a, a way to continue. And that continued as we ran out of food on that first trip. I mean, it's described at length in the, in the book, 
but there was this extraordinary sense also ultimately of being so the practice in the end especially after we ran out of food where we really didn't know how things would go but this incredible kind of peace and acceptance that had kind of come over all of us that we were in this sacred land we were in the the womb of the earth and that whatever happened was going to be fine it was a very strange feeling that i shared with my that that time my uh, main traveling companion at that time was uh, ken storm so when we finally came across the hunter the two hunters with their dogs we were almost disappointed it was a very very strange thing even though we because such a peace had actually entered into us that everything that would happen would be fine of course the great we you know the, or none of our porters had food either so they were of course elated as were we but there was a strange sense the practice was really about a radical acceptance of whatever was offered by the hidden land knowing that you were as it were in the heart of the world in the heart of the mother the shakti and that life and death are in a certain sense just not illusions but they're just part of a play the lila you know that's then there's something deeper than all of that and the way that our everyday experience was guiding us was into that deeper strata of reality in which our ordinary way that we negotiate between hope and fear life and death just seemed like a more surface um approach to two things so i think that's the practice really was was as i said more than specific rituals it was ultimately just accepting and then i think the other question was that about uh shakti can you yeah can you... uh the question was that uh how do you uh, uh you know focus on the uh, feminine energies unless you are traveling with a, um, a female companion yeah yeah well that very the nature itself uh even our own innermost nature let alone the outer nature is is the feminine is the female companion so that we're never separate from so we're not talking here about uh necessarily mm -hmm. tapping into those energies through their human form where again it's going to this deeper strata where we're in the shakti pita so the pita meaning the that place in which the shakti meaning that which the animating energies of manifest reality are ever present that is the shakti pit and that shakti pit is also it's in us not just in the outer landscape but it's finding where those two interconnect and intersect which is the real meaning so when we receive let's say from a guru a shakti shakti pot which is this kind of infusion of um, of shakti so what does that shakti do it's a remembrance of our own transcendent if you will or self-transcendent nature in which we recognize that we are just an energy field that's that's expressing itself sometimes adventitiously as a human being but we actually tapped into our deeper nature which is an ecstatic self-transcendent state which is at the same time has this pervaded by wisdom and 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 spontaneous compassion because we recognize that we're all interconnected and inseparable from everything so that that is also a forgetting it's it's the remembering of our true nature while letting go of that which is extraneous so that really is the power that we receive from the guru but in this case it's the landscape is the guru the place is the guru so what is a guru is simply that which brings us into resonance with our deepest nature and the deepest nature here is this extraordinary landscape and that is the mother it's the shakti it's also the and it's that which teaches us because it's continually reflecting our minds to ourselves we see when we get caught up in hope and fear we get we get caught up in thinking that we're oh we're we're gender specific we're not so even that when you think about oh the female companion it's no we're, we're everything at once so all these practices that we see so graphically represented sometimes in tibetan buddhist iconography is really pointing to an internal process where those same polarities are operative within us and it's in that sense it's transgender um and that's really important to remember otherwise one gets caught up and saying oh one has to have a male par partner or a female partner for for all this kind of uh radical awakening to arise but that's not in any way what the what what's being pointed at that's just kind of what would appear to on a superficial level to be the case but it's all happening internally but then that internal reality is not separate from the external either everything is this field of just of the shakti
which is of course just you know if we think of it shiva and shakti i mean we're we're talking about in physics particle and wave you know it's just the way we look at it it's e equals mc2 it's energy and uh and matter are equally you know what we think of matter is just energy expressed in slightly slower moving form so all of that that we can even see as science speaks to us about the nature of phenomenal reality and its energetic substratum is something that the tradition is also in a certain sense alluding to and which the experience in particular uh arises within our own field of experience in these spaces where that's activated by the power of the place yeah and i really uh, i really uh, feel that landscape and memory and the the memory that is embedded in this landscape gets triggered with the landscape and that is what connects us and puts us in puts us in union with that inner realm that we kind of forget because there's so much of chaos around and to get to that point where we actually look into ourselves it's that journey that we have to take it's more almost like you're taking that journey in the landscape but it's a journey within and you realize it when you reach there so it's almost like that and uh, i also find the word shakti like even uh, because it's so gendered um the shakti is inherent in males as well as females so almost like it is in you like uh, i i have the shakti in me that's how we talk about strength and all of that and uh, the way it comes out in sacred scriptures as well but this is so fascinating of looking at it from the physical and the uh, the, the realm the inner realm and what a fascinating journey and um, um ian we do have a question from uh, peter van ham i'm sure you know mm -hmm. about peter's work as well uh his documented alchi guge and most recently um uh his book mandala is really doing well uh mm -hmm. peter over to you your question and then i'll take everybody else's question who have uh, mm -hmm. raised their hands thank you sonali hi in nice to meet you finally <laughs> nice to meet you finally yeah. <laughs> i've been a big fan of yours huh do you see that I do I th indeed thank you okay yeah. I've been in I'm touch with been in touch with both Ken's Ken Cox and Ken Storm for quite some time never oh, made good. it up to you I you were always gone or something I tried contacting you but now we're sort of in person together so I'm very happy about that I want to really congratulate you to your life actually not just the journeys but what you have experienced and how you have advanced and you know the efforts that you've put into spiritual advancement and using these fascinating landscapes and these fascinating regions and the people for you know getting to the core of things i think this is what we all strive for where we maybe have you know when we in some nice place looking at things and there's how the how it speaks to our heart but then really getting into a you know a culture that has this established as a place as a trigger for a spiritual change or a spiritual awakening but also seeing that the landscape um is filled with that and is, it, it takes certain landscapes to actually trigger um the experiences that we get um one question i have is regarding um, well first of all thank you that you did that because i always wanted to go to the hidden falls and i always wanted to go to pemaku and i'm very happy that i didn't have to because <laughs> like <laughs> reading in the zangpo gorges and now seeing those images again and and hearing you talk about it you know and many times when i do lectures i'm always really you know kind of you know thinking why are people asking this questions why you know how do you, how did you manage to survive and how did you do these things these are all natural things to us that we do these exploration things but when i look at your specific travels you know i come into the position to pose these questions too because i'm really amazed at how can you survive this because you know as you said you were always you were almost starving and i i thought that in your whole lecture all the places that you went to be it you know starting in langtang or wherever this is all so terrible in the sense of that the landscape is so harsh and so difficult and and i was in arunachal pradesh i was there you know 
you don't have to go there in monsoon to be soaking wet wherever you travel and you have leeches and you have all these things how can you you know how can you this is one of the questions how can you go to a cave that is totally humid and the drips are running down and meditate there i mean that's why I say congratulations to your spiritual advancement. Because I couldn't do that. And when I listened to the Dalai Lama, when the typical statement that he said, um, you know, you try to meditate, but you come to understand how powerful a fly is. Like it's, mm -hmm. you know, buzzing around you. And where is your concentration there? But with all this hardship that you experienced, how do you do that? And that's the one question. Like you, you must have had a lot of, you know, provisions taken along and all these things, but, you know, you ran out of it. And the second thing is what really amazed me that at the center, I didn't know that it's not in the Zankbo Gorges, at the center of the, of the um, between A and B, so the hidden falls of these things there, there was actually really an opening, you know, that slit in the, in the wall. Mm -hmm. How did that person you know, come to come to know this, because when I see you and your group on these ropes and then really, you know, almost, you know, falling into the, the Zangpo there, how did they travel there? It must have been like that 500 years ago and there must have been no road, nothing. And yeah. I cannot imagine a Lama taking ropes with him just to find the entrance to these places, uh, to this inner realm of of Pema Ko and but it, it happened it seemed to have happened I, I really don't understand how people actually really took mm. the hardship they took like you took to find these 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 entrances to whatever Bayou there may be so that yeah, yeah. My questions. <laughs> thanks a lot no though that's part of the for me part of the mystery is is in fact exactly as you said to sort of start you know with with what you mentioned last you know that oval doorway as it were that's unreachable and yet one can see it from much further up but not from the angle that we we didn't see it in, in our case until we got below but then as we if we climb back out of the gorge then we could see where one could look down at it and i think and then and in the text what it describes is that once you enter into that that portal then it gets more and more sort of Harry Potter-esque in the sense that, you know, it's like, you know, you travel for days and all kinds of, you know, uh, supernatural phenomena arise and then you enter into the, you know, the innermost hidden land. So to me, these were places that were, you know, like, you know, the phenomena of Rangjung, you know, these spontaneously arising phenomena that we can see in rocks throughout the Himalayas. Oh, that's the footprint of Guru Rinpoche's horse, or it's the Baga of Bajiogini, or it's the eye of a Dakini. So all these things that can be to some degree suggestive, I think are taken to, you know, it's like reading clouds or, or as many people do gazing at the North face of Kailash and seeing all kinds of things in it. You know, it's like the, the landscape becomes a tarot card and you sort of drawing wherever your attention is drawn it's like, oh, wow, that's that. And so it's a way of deep, um, you know, I don't mean, not in a, in a positive sense, it's a sense of magic realism because magic realism allows for more possibility than a, than a strictly realistic view of reality, which is just confined to our own habits of rational perspective, which we know have, have limits. So I think that it must have been that, uh, you know, those descriptions are based upon the incredible inspiration that powerful places in nature have to inspire our imaginations on the one end, or one could argue on another level that would be more, you know, the insider perspective is that, well, they saw that and they weren't limited, they, you know, they could travel there, you know, th through, you know, it's just the way the Panchen Lama traveled to Shambhala, he didn't have to do it on foot, he could do it through his meditative realization. So, you know, that would be the other argument that um, those Tertans, the treasure revealers, were able to find those portals. And then through the suspension of conventional mind as such, we're able to move through them into these non-ordinary states that were somehow triggered by uh, and through sympathetic resonance with, with the seeming, what we call outer landscape. And so... I think that's that's what I see partly in that. And at the same time, there's this power of um, 
you know, when you asked, you know, the first part of your question is, as I'm sure we're all asked, when we were compelled by these places, you know, how do you survive? But I mean, survival isn't something we're really, I know it's not what drives us to survive or not, I, I suppose. It's more of the compelling nature uh, that such a romance, if you want to call it that, with, with, with magic and possibility opens for us. You know, it's like, any kind of relationship we have with something we're not thinking about you know, it's it's you know it's it's it assumes us and i would also say in that in that when i first went to the himalayas you know when i was 19 my big thing in life then was 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 rock climbing and mountaineering and ice climbing so i i went to the himalayas before i really knew anything about buddhism uh because they were the highest mountains in the world and because I was innately drawn to dangerous uh, places uh, in the sense that I felt so enlivened by, you know, cliffs and mountaintops. And so when my, the Kappa Kaldan, who was my Tonkin painting teacher in Kumbu, said when I was seeing what he was painting on the sides, I said, oh, that's kind of magic. You know, we have the Diatara in the center, but then you've got waterfalls and cliffs. And he said, oh, these are not just you know, these are actual places, they're hidden lands, you know, I said, what are they? And he said, oh, well, they're just, they're very, very difficult, dangerous to reach. So of course, you know, with, as a 19 year old feeling that you're immortal anyway, and with rock climbing being, you know, your kind of approach that I took towards life, which is like, make it as difficult as possible, because then the greatest possibility will emerge and something will shift. So that's, so I kind of came at all of this from that perspective where I was, you know, the more challenging it was, the more exciting it was. Um, so I think that kind of carried over for my whole approach to these places generally, where, you know, you kind of- That's why you could meditate in, in humid caves where drips- Well, were, were that's, the re that's a really, really good question too. And I think that's something that, you know, we is very worthy to, yeah, as, a, as His Holiness Dalai Lama has talked about, whether it's a mosquito, whether it's a fly, you know, how- you know, we can be so easily distracted by something so small or by a thorn in the foot, you know, from, you know, biblical traditions, all of those things. So what does that, the challenge that we then have to, to go deeper, you know, when the outer um, obstacles and the outer distractions, how do those distractions become uh, assets in a certain sense that they can, they, they show us where our mind is limited. And, uh, for sure, those were things I struggled with in some of those cave retreats where it's just like was so kind of like, why am I making this as difficult as possible when I could just be, you know, you could stay as some people prefer to do in a five star hotel room and, you know, have, have food delivered to your room and just put the shades down. You have your perfect dark retreat. But I don't know. There was something for me, the, the Robinson Crusoe aspect of it, the survivalist nature of it. There was something that you know, when those breakthroughs did happen that I found was powerful. And that even in states of where you just think this is, this is insane. And then, then a breakthrough would happen. So that was something for me that was very surprising where I find that the, the most, right when I reached a point where almost in despair, like, why am I doing it this way? Then something would shift. And then, you know, lots of, so I don't know. I don't know what the formula is for that, but there's some kind of alchemy of uh, obstacle and uh, sudden acceleration that I felt uh, throughout that. That would put it together that outside and inside are interconnected because it means that when the obstacles were high, then all of a sudden the shift started. And, mm -hmm. and at the same time, you were looking for these obstacles in order to, so to say, in a shift to happen. But I'll be quiet now because we have so many other people wanted to ask a question. I'll be in New York from 17th uh, of April onwards. I don't know if you will be there. I'll be opening my exhibition on Alchi at the Tibet house. So I would be happy if you would be on the East Coast during that time and we could, you know, get together and meet or something like that. Well, maybe I would we love to. So I would love, we'll stay in touch. I would love to have, I'm actually in Santa Fe now, but I fly on Monday to Asia and I'll be in India for about six weeks coming okay. up soon. So. Let's be in touch. It was great meeting you. It was a great lecture. Thank you very much. For Thank you very much, you. Peter. Thank and, you. I, and I do want to tell everyone that we're starting um, the uh, Himalayan uh, uh, Conservation and Preservation Society in the States. And uh, Ian has agreed to be, be a board member. So we are very excited about that. And uh, so a lot more will be coming. 
and Peter will always be connected, all of us. We love the Himalaya so much. And as you were asking questions on um, uh, you know, Ian's journey, uh, I remember this one journey I had, Rajoli was in it, Rajoli and Rina and I, uh, we went near the Great Himalayan National Park and uh, the person who was leading us lost his way and we were going to um, the original spot for Shringa Rishi, who's mentioned in the Mahabharat. And uh, there was a, a downpour and we were so, it was re relentless, the rain. And uh, I had my son with me and I was told, oh, we'll walk for just two and a half hours. And it turned out to be walking 10 hours a day over precarious landscape. And there was a point where the cliff was totally straight and we had to hold on tufts of grass to climb it. And it was, you know, what how you were describing that uh, when such moments came and you felt, what the hell am I doing here? And um, there was a breakthrough. It was like the, the obstacles would come and it would make us con connect to ourselves inside in a way that I cannot explain. And that journey becomes uh, a journey of going inward, questioning things, understanding who you are, your placement, and the landscape helps you achieve that. So uh, I still call that trek the Jan Leva trek, the trek that almost took our lives. <laughs> but now we smile and we look back and we say, oh, we made it. We made it. So, um, so, so wonderful just listening to, you know, I know the landscape in Arunachal is just... Uh, very 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 dense and complicated and those vipers that you uh oh my god <laughs> what a journey let's take mm -hmm. the next question uh we have uh manan rajoli dev siddharth and mahima in that order i hope ian you're not pressed for time and i'm, I'm okay no no it's okay not okay like... yeah so manan your question uh, uh dr manan is a biochemist so i'm sure he may have very interesting questions for you so manan over to you uh, if you could put your video on as well. Uh, thanks, Sonali. I'll try to put my video on, but it's kind of dark here. Uh, mm -hmm. Just give me a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ian, this was a fantastic uh, talk, very inspirational. And uh, to share us a little bit of uh, my own experience. Uh, I was actually encouraged uh, through National Geographic to document every journey that uh, I have done. So my question is related to that. Uh, throughout your talk, I've seen some uh, very beautiful maps that you've shared and shown. Uh, I wanted to know how you were able to uh, make those or document those uh, maps or make those maps, especially through uh, very precarious and treacherous terrains that you've described. So how was it possible for you to document life at that moment? I mean, today we take help of Google Maps to refer back and forth. Mm -hmm. But back then, how was it? For, how did you go about with it? Sure. No, well, the map, those maps that I made, uh, those I made for the book, for the heart of the world, and those I did of you know, in the comfort of my of my house. But what I did is I used satellite imagery to be able to get a completely accurate uh, uh, depiction of the you know where the where the rivers were, et cetera, et cetera. But then on top of that, I then I drew basically, you know, the the mountains. I could I could locate those uh, for the most part, and then and then basically did all of the artwork for it uh, uh, subsequently. So. Those were created for the book, certainly not in the field. So in the field, it was based on, you know, photo documentation, but I wasn't specifically uh, making a map uh, on the ground. Uh, okay, because during my tricks, uh, this is a habit that I have uh, developed to map the entire journey, mm -hmm. wherein I document or wherein I come across a feature, I make a mark of, uh, make a note of it, or. Mm -hmm make a rudimentary map and then try to build on that. No, very nice. I like I like yeah. the idea of that. But no, I didn't do it that way. Ian, I'll, I'll send you the newsletter uh, where Manan contributed an article and uh, his maps are just like those old world maps that you see in, uh, you know, books of the British. It's, it's oh, I'd so love to see them. I'd yeah. love to see those. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Definitely yeah. look forward to it. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Manan. You. Uh, we'll yeah. take Rajoli's question. Rajoli, you're next. If you could put your video on. Hello. Good evening, sir. Good evening. 
you've disappeared. Thank you for this. Okay. Oh, no, there. I'm here. You're there. You're there. Got you. Got you. So I'm uh, so thankful to you for having this lecture and enlightening us with the things that were hidden and not known to us. Uh, so I have uh, one question. Actually, I have two. So the first question is, uh, so in our culture, we follow goddess Kali, and mm. there was uncanny resemblance uh, with uh, Vajrana Vahirahini. Mm. Uh, so like, you know, in our uh, idol that we've grown to, uh, you know, uh, pray and devote to, she also wears skull around her neck. And uh, she also has that third eye. And also there's this term called as uh, Shoshan Kali, which means goddess of the cremate, uh, crematory ground. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know if there is some uh, connection between uh, these two idols. And uh, another thing, uh, the second question was about, uh, like, are there any theories that kind of answer how these uh, texts that you've spoken about uh, like how uh, the natural forms, like you've uh, spoken about Abu Lashi, uh, the protector deity, and how they have kind of been, uh, you know, seen in the natural form, uh, like the gods that you were talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. So these are the two questions that I have. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, so Smashan Kali, so the Kali of the cremation ground, she has an exact counterpart in uh, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition called Troma Nagmo. So that's Troma is the, the, literally the dark, the black uh, Troma is depicted just as you saw Vajavarahi, but in the, her case, she's black and she's more wrathful looking. She looks much more like Kali, or at least the wrathful side of Kali. Actually, Kali can be very beautiful, but in, in the case of the Tibetans depiction of literally their version of Kali, she's much more kind of uh, terrifying looking. So she's considered to be the secret manifestation, actually, of uh, Vajavarahi. So Vajavarahi, as we saw, was the diamond Sao, uh, who is the Vajrayoginis. So outwardly, there's out Vajrayogini. Then inwardly, there's uh, the sow headed or the sow uh, throated Vajavarahi. And then there's uh, Tromanakmo, who is almost identical with Kali, the Kali, as it's referred to. And uh, so for sure, this is where I think, you know, the deep syncretism between the Hindu Tantra and the Buddhist Tantra is, uh, let's say, both traditions tend to, well, let's say the Buddhist tradition tries to distinguish itself. But I think the Hindu Tantra is more openly inclusive and recognizes that these were like the deity Tara, for example, they even in the Kaula, you um, Kaula tradition, they say, you know, that was brought in from the Buddhist side, but the Buddhists try to think that these are all kind of manifested on their own and they don't really acknowledge i'd say the debt that they have to the the the, the you know the the shaiva shakti traditions um and why it's up sometimes it's called Sha, you know shaiva buddhism as a synonym by some people but but uh, but not by um not by others so for sure kali in particular is very powerful and they're specific rituals and practices and meditations on that um, that Tibetan iteration you could say of Kali and that's used to it's used in the Dzogchen the great perfection tradition <clears throat> as a means of just cutting through any kind of conceptual um, idea we have about ourselves to in order to enter into that pure nature like Chamunda, you know Chinamasta or Chamunda where we basically you know we sever our heads you know we sever the conceptual mind in order to fully realize the, the the full energetic expression of our enlightened awareness. So, so I think all of that, we see parallels uh, between Tromanakmo and Kali, between Chimunda, Chamunda and uh, Chintamani, uh, not Chintamani, but uh, Chinamasta. And um, that to me is the beauty of the tradition. There are just different ways in which the different cult Indic cultures have kind of taken it in slightly different ways to uh, to represent a core idea of going uh, in revering, as it were, our self-transcendent nature in all of its diverse expression. And so then your, your second question was uh, about Abu Lashu, which was the uh, 
Abu in Tibetan literally means sort of uncle. So it's kind of really a more of an animistic, in this case, it was kind of an animistic tradition of, of mountain worship and nature worship that existed in Tibet prior to the arrival of Buddhism. And the same way that we see the syncretism of Hindu and Buddhist Tantra, we see in Tibet, the syncretism of a pre-Buddhist Bun animism, shamanism with, um, with uh, Vajrayana Buddhist philosophy and iconography and traditions. Um, but I'm sorry, can you, Rajal, you had a specific question though about, about that. Can you just um, reiterate that? Yeah, I kind of got my answer. So like, like you just explained, you already had the tradition of nature worship in uh, Tibetan region. So yeah. yeah, maybe from that's where the text kind of inculcated the idea. Yeah, so that's again, that idea, that merging of, of yeah, the shamanic animist nature worship with, uh, yeah, with the right. philosophical traditions of India. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Also, Rajoli, like next time when I do my basic tantra course, enroll in it. <laughs> you are in yeah. the institute, so yeah, I know the timing is always odd. But yeah, those of you who want to know about Hindu tantra and you know the basics, basically about what tantra is and what is literal and what are metaphors and how to read um, thangkas and all of that, you can just uh, enroll for the course. I offer it at least once or twice a month. Um, and yeah, and uh, uh, listen to the talks that uh, Dr. Ian Baker uh, gives. Those are wonderful. He also does courses uh, uh, online. You can, uh, you know, follow him and you can be, keep updated on the courses that he uh, teaches. Um, over to the next question. Uh, we have uh, Dave with a question. Then I'll take Siddharth and then Mahima. Dave, over to you. And if you could put your video on, that would be great. Thanks a lot, Ian. That was an awesome, awesome talk. And I was, I think I read one of your articles years ago about going into that area. And it's beautiful, even back then, when I first saw those pictures that you were. Uh, I was just wondering what one couple of things. One was, in the beginning, you said something about the, a place called Udiana. Mm -hmm. Is that a real, is that an actual place in, uh, or is it like a mystical place? And then the second totally different question is when you went to these hidden places and these caves, was there a different energetic level? Like not so much emotionally, but more like physically in the area. Mm -hmm. Yep. So first about Udiana, Udiana definitely was a very real place. It was a kingdom in what's now uh, recognized as the Swat Valley in, uh, in Pakistan, in the lower Hindu Kush mountains. And it was, um, invaded basically i think it was from the, from the 11th century there was a very kind of turkic uh, islamic invasion it was but what's actually particularly interesting when that happened there was uh, we know in the whole gandhara civilization uh, also in pakistan but there were in that area there were over 1100 i think it was tibetan no, sorry buddhist monasteries that there were were destroyed uh, during the, uh, the Islamic um, invasions, and a lot of the monks and nuns from those areas escaped uh, and went up the, um, the 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 river into the Swat uh, into what was then Udiana. So when we think of Udiana as it's described as kind of the birthplace of Buddhist tantra, it makes sense to me when we think that the early kind of Mahayana uh, monasteries were destroyed, and then suddenly these uh, uh, practitioners, monks and nuns, had to go and integrate within uh, a very different kind of uh, circumstances, in the, basically become householders uh, in a, a, an area that we know also from the record had a very strong tradition of uh, Shaiva Tantra, because in a certain sense, there were direct trade routes on the musk trails between there and Kashmir, etc., uh, but we also know that there was, even from accounts of the time of Alexander the Great, there, even when Alexander traveled to that area, there was also Dionysian uh, cult uh, in Udiana, in the Swat Valley. There's actually archaeological records of, of a very extensive viniculture of the cultivation and production of uh, grapes and production of wine. There was mass dance ceremony. There were many things that we can actually associate with Vajrayana today, you know, from theater to kind of Dionysian, this idea of of a transformational intoxication. So when we think about how that came into somehow contact with uh, with refugee monks, Mahayana monks and nuns, 
and we're also encountering Shaiva Tantra, we can really see this incredible sort of meeting place and uh, that would have very easily have given rise to that reformulation of Buddhism that we talk of, speak of as the third turning of the wheel of Vajrayana. So that's that's the Udiana. But then, as it said, it became more and more difficult to travel there, and the Islamic presence became more and more strong. So over time, it wasn't a place that Tibetans could could sort of seek out as a as a place of pilgrimage because it was no longer amenable uh, to them. So that's sort of a shorthanded version. There's a lot more subtlety with that, but it was a very real place. Um, and again, particularly associated with with Padmasambhava who again, as we see even iconographically, sort of holds many elements of Shiva as well as uh, uh, being an icon iconic, um, uh, you know, Mahasiddha. But also also many of the Mahasiddhas were, were commonly uh, revered both in the Hindu and, and uh, Buddhist traditions, including Saraha, who was considered the greatest of and earliest of them. So I think this wonderful syncretism and Udiana was a great living example of that. It's a shame that it, then it became basically taken over by the Taliban today. So it's not a place that we can probably go and feel deeply inspired by the yeah, old- Because Christians. they have Buddhism, like they're the Bamiyana Buddhists, they put Buddhas and all that goes, like Buddhism had a huge sprawl before like- Yeah, that was the- All of Asia was Buddhism. Yeah, that whole Silk Road area, you know, was, was, was the powerful, uh, transmission of Buddhism, even all, all the way across to Greece. So it's a, a very interesting area. Um, thanks, Dave. Uh, we'll take the next question. Siddharth, uh, over to you. Hello. Hi, Sonali. Just hi. give me one second. <laughs> yeah, I should introduce uh, Siddharth. Uh, Siddharth uh, finished his uh, doctoral studies from Oxford, and uh, he's right now in uh, Germany. And uh, more, uh, he's written a wonderful book, Fossils, and uh, it's, it's, he's so inspiring himself. I'm so happy you're here, Siddharth. Thank you. Thank you, Sonali, so much for your very gracious introduction. I wasn't in Oxford. I was in the other place, Cambridge. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that Ian would, uh, would understand the, the importance of making both of these two places being quite distinct. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Ian. This is so beautiful. Thank you so much. I'm uh, delighted to have been a part of this wonderful and very special, I would say, um, presentation. Uh, I, I have had um, two research interests, uh, I guess, since the time I became a researcher in English and cultural studies and now in geo-humanities. One was and is still a fantasy literature and the second is uh, the Himalayas. And it was so wonderful uh, for me to listen to you and to especially note and observe constantly your sort of uh, <laughs> literary references to children's literature and fantasy literature in order to you know, also sort of uh, describe your, your own journey in the Himalayas. So that was lovely, especially because I keep alternating between these two fields almost on an everyday basis. I'm a historian of Shimla. I come from Shimla, but I have also did my PhD in fantasy. So both of these are sort of always going together. And here in Germany, I am researching um, researching the Himalayas, especially of Himachal Pradesh. Um, uh, every, I mean, I, ha I have loads of questions, but I'll just ask one here. The uh, One of the final images you showed of that broken specter, um, that uh, that sort of hallowed misty reflection that you saw uh, at the at the very top, and that was taken as a good sign or a good mm -hmm. omen, right? Yeah. Um, and that reminded me. Uh, so my mentor and uh, good friend, uh, the nature writer Robert McFarlane, he recently posted exactly the same photograph uh, from his uh, journeys up in the Cairngorm. Uh, mountains from where he comes from uh, on Instagram and it immediately it was literally the same image that you showed me as well so mm -hmm. that was a, a wonderful sort of a reflection there and but I was especially taken by what you uh, said as to how it is in, it was interpreted by the locals who were also accompanying you which was that it was taken as a good good sign and I just wanted to so in my question in a way sort of relates to Peter's uh, query as well how do you, um, experientially speaking, when, and I know that this happens quite often in journeys in the Himalayas, that 
things or changes in weathers or certain particularities or certain idiosyncrasies of bad weather patterns and all are taken as good signs or bad signs. Um, and we are all, or we would like to believe ourselves as rational thinkers as well. But then how do you at these very, you know, these moments uh, sort of deal with it, <laughs> you know, experientially speaking, is it, it, is it like a, you know, cold region willing suspension of disbelief and you just go ahead because it's a local knowledge or is there, um, is there still uh, a kind of a tension in your sort of existential philosophical self, you know, um, that you are accepting it and you have to accept it because you are with the locals, but within yourself, you might also not be entirely sure of whether to believe this or not. So I just want to have a very sort of a personal answer, if you can, uh, about this, this sort mm -hmm. of a dilemma that we can't ever in a way explain rationally because in a way it sort of falls in the realm of the spiritual or the fantastical or the imaginative or the irrational or the poetic, whatever you want to call it. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, there is a, you know, we kind of, we kind of go along with it because that's the only way to do so in, in, in these treacherous domains. So yes, mm -hmm. you know, your personal question, um, you know, reflections on this thing. Sure. Sure. No, thank you for all of that. And I think those are all very, very interesting, uh, interconnected ideas. And, um, I would suppose, I mean, from my own experience in the hidden lands from, from the first time, you know, I had lots of, there were lots of really non-ordinary phenomena that occurred uh, during those initial retreats. I mean, strange appearances, yeah. uh, you know, fireball voices. So there was already a kind of direct introduction. And this is actually before even going to Pemaku, uh, to a sense of magic realism as being more real than our common uh, objective sense of reality. And that was already shifting me into a, you know, whether we call it a, a suspension of disbelief or an, an adoption of magical thinking, I found that actually allowing the possibility to, I always, again, to quote from, a, I always like Emily Dickinson's um, beautiful line, dwell in possibility. Yes. So if we dwell in possibility, then anything seems possible. And we don't limit ourselves by thinking that everything has to be rationally constrained. So, for example, then in Pemico, when these kind of phenomena would occur, it was it was not even a question of like saying, oh, I'm going to adopt this local view that this is uh, this meteorological event is not just coincidental. It's actually uh, causal or it's something else to it. It was really about just allowing for that possibility. So let's say in Einstein's sense, it's about a thought, it's a thought experiment. You just allow yourself to take on that sense of reality because that sense of reality is, serves much better and allows for new possibilities to emerge uh, rather than kind of trying to categorize it as something, it's either this or that. So we go, it's both end. I mean, it doesn't mean that we completely suspend our rational mind. Um, I think we can fly or whatever else it might be, but I think that sense of suspending the kind of constraints of binary thinking in such situations allows us to, to live in the best of both worlds simultaneously, the magic and you could say the realism. Thank you. That is a wonderful, sophisticated answer. Thank you so much. Thanks, Anali. This was really, really lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Siddharth, for being here. Uh, the next question is from Mahima. Uh, Mahima, if you could come online. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Yeah, and I Am just I want to... You're, you're audible. And uh, Ian, I want to introduce you to Mahima because uh, she's actually driving to Delhi right now. And very um, religiously, she came online <laughs> to hear you talk. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, Mahima's village is where um, the institute is now located. Uh, if you remember, I sent you a photograph of our own Pemico <laughs> with the waterfall. Yes, the, the waterfall in that little gorge. That you yes, sent yes, yeah. yes. So uh, Mahima, uh, what is your question? Yes, uh, well, I don't have one question. I have a lot of them because I've been... I've been listening to the entire um, talk so intensely. However, I asked a question and asked him later. And I just would like to say, Ian, that was just, you know, the whole presentation was so interesting. In fact, at every slide, I had a question. So, yeah, the curious one, I would say. Um, 
presently, I would like to ask, you know, so when you visit these sacred places, uh, uh, you know, all these places which are very, uh, which have a different energy, what is the kind of feeling that you uh, experience? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so is there some kind of a, yeah. Okay, should I, you want me to answer that, uh, Mahima, or was there yeah. something more you wanted to say, add to that first? No, that's, that's it. That's it. So I guess, yeah, so you're talking sort of about the energy of, of different places and the energies that they hold. So that's, you know, it's very interesting for, let's say, for these sacred places in the Tibetan tradition, because they often speak about uh, their three categories. There's the the uh, Shiwa, which means the peaceful. Uh, and then there's the, uh, the, the, the Drakpo, which is the wrathful. And then there's the Shidra, which is the uh, the peaceful and the wrathful. Mm -hmm which is kind of more of an ecstatic. So these three are qualities that are associated with, with tantric deities, but there are also qualities that are associated with tantric topographies, if you will. So the sacred places in the tradition. So if one's meditating on a wrathful deity, let's say, uh, then one is advised sometimes to go to a particular, to a kind of wild and uh, just the way Yeshi Tsogyal practiced her tumor yoga of inner fire in a very wild high mountain cave for example or if you're going to be meditating on uh, avalokitasvara and trying to bring about you know world peace you know you'd want to go to a very gentle landscape with you know maybe deer around rather than wild wolves and carnivorous bears you know it would be it, it the idea is that the landscape reflects the way in which the disposition of our mind uh both naturally as well as in terms of what qualities we're trying to cultivate because sometimes we want to cultivate those kind of wild ecstatic energies because those sometimes can be seen as more powerful methods for over, kind of overcoming whatever inner outer obstacles we may be working with um so certainly in pemico there were places that so each of those power places will have some connection to a to a deity so sometimes let's just say it would be vajrapani you know the wielder of the the thunderbolt uh the, of the vajra who you know appears like like zeus or um, or Hercules in kind of very wild form. And that's an energy that's, that that place will evoke and have been associated with that uh, quality. And sometimes they're ones that are more sort of male energies or female energies. So there's the Dakas and the Dakinis, kind of the two, the male and female counterparts of a kind of, um, of an inner energy. And so sometimes those places, if one sort of, uh, merges with them, which is the idea, of course, then, then those qualities start to become operative in you. And as you kind of get yourself out of the way, then that particularly that particular kind of deity manifestation starts to operate in you. And you just allow yourself to, in a certain sense, be possessed by the quality of the place, which is the quality of that tantric deity. And that tantric deity, of course, is not is just one aspect of our own psyche in the sense that our minds are infinitely interpenetrated by the environment. So we always have to think, you know, well, in what cases do we want to be interpenetrated by the environment? In which cases do we want to have a, a Vajra shield to protect ourselves? You know, so if we're in a rickshaw in Delhi, you know, to what degree do we want to be, you know, completely open and permeable? And what time, you know, when do we need to kind of, you know, in a certain sense, protect? And which in cases do we want to open? Um, so that's the dance, I think, of the whole process um, is how we work with uh, what we can appear appears as external appearances and, and and phenomena, and how we relate to it when we guard and when we open. And uh, so for me, it's it's and then it depends on what energy arises. So when we're when we're open, then we will immediately feel an energy uh, that's from a place, from a person. And we know sometimes intuitively when we need to kind of put our guard up, as it were, and when we need to just be open to, to the arising and to the heuristic arising of what can happen in that state of openness. And that happens, of course, with certain places in nature in the same way as it can with people. So that, that would be kind of one, one way I'd address that question of yours. Thank you. That was so very well answered. Um, thank you. Can, can I ask, are you in a car? Where Where are you? You're... Well, yes, we are driving through. We are on our way from Jalanda to uh, Ambala right now. And uh, yeah, so in between, you could not see me because there was no light. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. And 
and uh, 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 uh we have oh yeah hi hi sonali hi ian uh, i've been uh, sort of listening to your lovely talk yeah and my i i, I think you covered about 200 kilometers while since this thing is and he was very <laughs> intently listening to the conversation so, while driving uh, and he's uh, nice he's abhishek major in the indian army so <laughs> huh? very nice very nice yeah, yeah. so uh, thank you much sonali and uh, ian and yeah. in fact uh, i i used to listen to uh, some music by this guy called uh, prem joshua mhm uh, the very nice song since we are talking a lot about daikini there's a song called daikini lounge or something with prem joshua uh -huh. i see <laughs> okay. daikini lounge I'll, I'll, i'll look for that yeah <laughs> the daikini <laughs> lounge <laughs> wonderful <laughs> and uh, 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 of course uh, ian you will be meeting the both of them when you go to dhami uh, soon so they will okay. be there and uh, yeah yes, uh, thank you abhishek for uh, listening uh, to the talk we do mm. have Let another yeah <laughs> we have uh, one last question this is the last question we'll take puneet yep. if you could ask your question uh is he there mm -hmm. yeah i think we need your yeah voice. i was on yeah, the call yeah yeah uh, good evening everyone hi ian so uh it's said that today is a night of shiva and uh, there is a lot of uh, power and energy in the universe and if you sit straight you wake uh, throughout the night so that energy will flow into you and i think the ppt you shared and the talks and the questions people have asked will uh, help you to be awake through the night so uh, with the uh, what all uh, we listen today uh, reminded me of a, a novel i read 10 years ago from uh, robin sharma or the mongoose sold his ferrari so he uh, the, the lawyer in that uh, uh, novel julian mantel he went to himalayas he was like uh, totally lost and then uh, he he met a lama he took him into some hidden places and then he healed up and he really came back very strong so at that time 10 years ago i was very fascinated and i thought like one day i will also try to find this hidden place but listening of the all what you mentioned today how much hard work and uh, <clears throat> the effort the days it took it will take to reach there i may have to drop my idea and now 10 years after looking at my age. but yeah uh, my question was more about uh, again a place that i'm very fascinated about and i think means it's a sacred place for buddhists as well kalash so uh, have you ever been there if yes like uh, what you felt and if not maybe uh, anything in brief what you have experience from the talks of or from the uh, stories from the studies you have done mm -hmm. he has been yeah. to kalash yeah i've been to kalash <laughs> 10 times actually so it's another whole <laughs> very, very uh, powerful it's a, yeah that's a whole subject in itself it's a Yeah, I was very fortunate to be able to go to Kailash. I forget what year it was, but it was the first time that the Nepalese had opened the pass from the Nepal side over the Zoyjala Pass into Purang and then up to Kailash. So I was able to go to Kailash, and I traveled there with the um, Dami Jangri, so from the Bun tradition. Um, and so my first encounter was it was through these extraordinary Bun shamans who would go into trance. We had to follow also a trail. through nepal uh, that was their old uh, because their source of power was at manasarovar the base of kailash and so we had to travel on their old as it were their song lines so they would be the whole time you know we were already being kind of pulled into the magic realism of kailash and the power of kailash uh, as we went hmm. and then i went back several times i went went back for a national Ge to do a national geographic article uh, but in every and i've gone around it the bunpo way you know going around counterclockwise and i've also gone around the clockwise way and i've also was very fortunate uh, there was a period when it was relatively more easy now it's very been sealed off to go into the inner sanctum the inner sanctuary of kailash so according to tibetan tradition you uh, can only go into the inner sanctuary after going around the mountain 13 times unless you go in the year of the horse in which case going around the mountain once is equal to 13 so then one can go right in um so the inner sanctuary is extraordinary and the lama who was based at uh 
um, Gyandrak Monastery there when I asked about this tradition of why it is that uh, you have to go around 13 times. Uh, he said that it was simply because the inner sanctuary was the place where the meditators would stay, the yogis would stay in caves there. And if pilgrims came, they would, yeah, they'd bring food, but it would also be very distracting. So they wanted to, they created a tradition uh, whereby, you know, it was held that the outer pilgrimage is what was appropriate for pilgrims to get the blessings of the mountain and the inner sanctuary is where uh, yogis and yoginis would stay to meditate. So anyway, so I had the great fortune you know, to experience all different aspects of Kailash and to do the so-called inner uh, pilgrimage, the inner uh, Kora around actually the peak of what they call Nandi. So that inner sanctuary has, has also wonderfully has its own uh, Tibetan Buddhist iconography to it, but it also has very much the Shaiva uh, imprint on it as well. Because uh, you're going around the uh, the image of, of the, around the peak that's equated with 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 Nandi as it's ba uh, bowing to, Shi uh, to Shiva on the summit of Kailash. So yeah, it's for me it was an incredibly resonant, powerful mountain that I've had yeah wonderful experiences of in every possible conditions, bright sun and blizzards and um, yeah, it's an incredible part of the world and it's. As we know now, it's kind of been hidden away again during since the time of COVID. Tibet's only just beginning to open this spring after several years in which travel to Tibet generally, but to Kailash in particular, hasn't been possible. So it will be very interesting to see what happens. There have been lots of change there, certainly in the time that I was there. Um, but it's it's absolutely... Uh, one of the most, you know, it's it's another heart of the world, as it were. It's the axis of the axis mundi. The so, yeah. I hope you get a chance to get there. Yep, hope so. Yeah. Thanks. Mm. Thank you, Puneet. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, what a wonderful journey that you took us on on hidden lands, and. Um, just uh, we are just you made our Saturday the Saturday vibe was so strong today um, and um, um, I think Siddharth has just mentioned hope Ian when you're uh, visiting uh, Shimla do visit Tara Devi uh, a mm -hmm. goddess common to Buddhism and Hinduism sure. so yeah I've been to Tara Devi and it's really nice and uh, I'm sure we'll we'll have a good itinerary for him uh, Ian you know we always sign sign off with words of wisdom that you will leave us with. I'm sure, you know, um, your talk itself was filled with wisdom that we can, you know, ruminate over and uh, think about. Um, so what are your words of wisdom for today uh, to leave us all with? Well, I'll take it as a sign that I was just sent a direct message. Uh, that's hidden from everyone else. It says, of all the beautiful places you've been, which have you felt is the most powerful? So I'll take that as the question to, uh, to answer is that, you know, of all the places I've been, they're all potentially the most powerful. And it's really the, these places that are beautiful, that are so wonderful, can inspire us to kind of drop the veils uh, that uh, sometimes obscure the possibility that's there in every moment. And this is, again, where I would... You know, uh, since we're uh, the, the allowance for quoting from from outs from Western literature as well. You know, this is again William Blake. You know, to see heaven in a grain of sand and eternity in an hour. This is really what all of the when we recognize that everything is interconnected. That there might be particular places that trigger and inspire us uh, in one particular moment, but there might be another place another time. So I'd say it's this universe that we're in, the powerful and incredible experience and opportunity we have as human beings for our short duration um, in order to experience things the way we can um, in this dimension and to actually where we can uh, to drop those veils so that we can again to see everything that's infusing this reality in ways that are often hidden to us because we have our prevailing uh our our, our our habits of inattention and so i think that's really the what i would say is that just everything we look at you know it's the grain of it's like right now it's been snowing here in santa fe and the sun is out but it's in the rays of you know it's the snowfall and the rays of the sun it's it's everywhere and everything is powerful. It's the, you know, the universe is powerful and it's all um, just 
a question of of paying attention sometimes to to the incredible beauty and power and magic that that the uh, the world offers us in every moment so i'm afraid that's all i can uh, muster up uh, in terms of words of so-called wisdom but i think it's so beautiful that the himalayas has inspired you know from from the earliest recorded history in the indic world uh you know it was himavat in the vedas but certainly those incredible magical mountains and all of the hidden wonders that they hold from their magical plants to their magical places and traditions and i'm just so inspired by all the work you're doing uh and with your you know all of your associates to to bring greater and greater attention to how the himalayas becomes a way in which helps us to to look at aspects of our experience in other parts of the world and uh so that's exciting to me. I mean, here in Santa Fe, there's, of course, all kinds of sacred mountains around here that are even you have to get permits from some of the tribes sometimes yeah. to even go go near up to go Pedernal, for example. Uh, so to me, that's a wonderful idea that places are still held to be sacred and that there are certain rites and rituals you have to go through in order to be able to to visit them. And then as a result, what visits you when you go to those places can be all the more powerful. Yes, and and uh, you know I echo that thought. Of, uh, I remember in Kulu Valley where the institute was, there was this whole mountain uh, in the in the front, and I always looked at it as an embodiment of Shiva. I you know you, there was no Shiva written on it, but it's just you know that's how the deity spoke to me, and that's how that that the feature became uh, you know almost uh, uh, it was so sacred for me to just look and uh, know that uh, you know this uh, i'm protected and uh, i see the beauty in nature and uh, you know when my work there was done i have moved uh, to another place looking for more realms like that and uh, your talk today has personally been very very enriching for me because uh, i i feel it will help me on my own journey uh, with what i've been experiencing and i i thank you for that from the core of my heart and I can only, you know, uh, say that. And I look forward uh, to being in the Himalayas soon. But till that time, I look for the Himalayas within. And uh, thank you so much, Ian. This is thank been you very a, much for inviting me to come on this very auspicious day of Shiva Ratri. So may uh, may it be a blessed day for all of us. And yeah. thanks very, very much. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. Take care, all of you. See, uh, we'll see you next Saturday with Tulkur uh, Rinpoche's uh, talk uh, on the Heart Sutra. The Heart Sutra is a Sanskrit text, and uh, um, he will be uh, doing a commentary on the Heart Sutra. And it's a very important text because it really talks about uh, formlessness and form and beginning and end, things that we grapple with, uh, existentialism and all of that. And uh, he will be talking uh, about that. He is the uh, head of the key monastery in uh, Spiti and uh, the 18th reincarnation of Rinching Zangpo, the first architect of Buddhist monasteries in the Buddhist world. So those of you who can join, it'll be wonderful next week with Lochan Tulku Rinpoche. And um, over and out for all of us here at the Himalayan Institute. Bye. Bye and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian.